draught of his gazpacho. Yeah. Okay, I call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Uh, Commissioner Cunningham? Present. Commissioner Doe? Present. Commissioner Muneer? Here. Commissioner Parker? Here. Commissioner Reinhardt? Here. Well, okay. um, I'm here. We all are here today. That's good. Um, welcome to the Br Brisbane Planning Commission meeting. Today is Thursday, August 9th, 2012. And we have a special uh, agenda today, so we'll go through that today. This is, uh, I, mean, I was hoping to have more people here, but unfortunately, whatever we have, we will live with that. Um, so first item is adoption of agenda. Any any changes you or anything you guys want to add? Uh, no additions. Nothing? No. Okay. Who wants to make a motion to adopt the agenda? I'll make a motion to adopt the agenda. Okay, Ms. Karen. Second it. And Ms. Doe? I second, second that motion. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Oral communication. At this time, anyone in the audience would like to speak uh, on the items that are not part of the agenda, you're welcome to do so. Uh, I don't see any hands, so we will move on to the written communications. And uh, we got two pieces of. Um, Paper documents here, one from the California State Parks Foundation, and the other one is the Hart 2011 Annual Report. Everybody has got that. Uh, yeah, and uh, we were also handed out the copies of the Planning Commission CEQA training, a brief introduction to CEQA document, which we will go through in the next item here. Okay, uh, training. <coughs> CEQA training in preparation for the Bayland EIR. Um, this training is to build an information that was presented in the community training session on June 16th. In preparation for this training, please view the video of June 16th session if you were previously unable to attend. DVDs are available at City Hall or go to the following Bayland's web page to view it online and that is http dot slash slash www dot brisbane brisbane ca dot org dot department uh, forward slash departments slash building dot slash uh, dash and dash planning that's a hand mouthful this whole thing and <laughs> uh, <laughs> forward slash balance um, and forward slash balance on information I hope you all got that. If not, um, you can always contact the planning staff and they will provide you the proper website. Uh, before we um, hand over the, uh, our consultants uh, to go over this CEQA training for the, for the uh, planning commissioners, uh, I'd like to offer this opportunity to all the planning commissioners. If you have any specific uh, ideas or concerns or issues or uh, anything that you want the consultant to cover, uh, this is the opportunity. So I will start with Commissioner Doe. Do you have any uh, specific need or uh, specific uh, items that you want to, uh, for the consultant to cover? Um, at this point, uh, following the June 16th meeting, I asked the questions that uh, I felt that were pertained in and un unanswered at that uh, okay. June 16th session already. So I'm just awaiting what we have to cover today. Okay, Commissioner Reinhardt? Uh, no comments. No comments, nothing to, okay. <clears throat> Commissioner uh, Parker? Well, I just want to feel that I understand our role and also I would like to be able to maybe have some kind of a checklist so that when we have people from the community who want to um, present comments to uh, that will go into the EIR, the CEQA, that we can guide them in, um, in the correct way to uh, write it up so that uh, they will get a response, you know, so they won't just be overlooked, and then they will get a an adequate response. Commissioner Cunningham? Um, one of the concerns that I have is 
we we probably haven't had to deal with CEQA in Brisbane at this level ever before in our history. And as part of that, um, I would really like to know how applying CEQA to the Baylands with all of its differences, I'll call them at this point, versus anything that's come before anybody in this city in the last 50 years. How, how handling CEQA relative to that differs from how things have been done in the past. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> but I can give you an idea of what it's like on a big project. Right, because that, that's my concern is that, you know, I've, I've, I've heard CEQA, I've, I've been involved with meetings in the past where there's CEQA has been brought up at many different levels, um, and that was relative to, you know, open space, to the mountain, to whatever, um, but this is a completely different animal and I, I think I put in my comments on our survey to compare and contrast CEQA relative to the past and to what this project looks like. And if that's a little nebulous, I can probably make it a bit better as we move forward. Hmm. Okay. Um. When we were going through the, uh, you know, the selection of the consultant for this particular um, item, the Bayland CEQA, at that time I requested the the uh, city um, council that someone from the planning commission should be there to when we select the consultant, and I'm glad that we d we did that. Uh, my basic um, emphasis on this training process is. We just we don't want to just know what CEQA is, but what I like to do is at the end of the session, each one of us able to assess what's for each of the component of the CEQA the applicant is talking about because we have to make a decision. Uh, we have to listen to the uh, to the public, but ultimately we have to come up with a recommendation. And in order to make the recommendation, we had to have a solid foundation as to how the how to judge whatever the uh, the applicant is presenting us. So in that regard, what I like to do is I like to have to cons uh, have you discuss a little bit in detail. You don't have to go through the whole process, but in detail for each of the ele element, how anyone can assess whether the job is well done, whether the elements that they cover uh, meets these industry standards or whatever the, the guidelines are, so that we know that, okay, they did the air pollution study, and whatever they've done, first of all, the data they use, how to judge whether the data is appropriate or not, how to judge the method, methodology that they use is appropriate or not, and then, we can come up with a very fairly good idea as to yes, this is not just a hogwash, but it's really a good, solid analysis being done. So, with your expertise and you have reviewed so many of the sequels, uh, I th believe that you will be able to guide us so that all of us sitting here at the end of the CEQA process be able to make a decision that yes, this was a right thing that they did. Yes, this is the criteria one should use. Yes, this is the uh, the recommendation we should make. And that's the my main con main thing that I want to get out of this session. Uh, I really like the the initial session that you had, the first one. I think you covered the the process steps of the CEQA very well. In this session, I like to more emphasize more how to review each of the elements and how to judge whether it's good or bad or whatever uh, the part involved in that. So that's my goal in this particular one. Do you, you have anything to add to that or any other? No, that, that makes sense. I mean, I think it ties into my comments about, you know, how does this huge project 
And, and, and I know it's very difficult to, uh, to explain all the industry standards and all that, but at least give us a little rundown. And if you can't, uh, time constraint, at least give us some guidance as to where we can find that so we can review on our own that this is what you can find this information if you're reviewing the, the hazmat, uh, you know, the disposal of that or, uh, or remedy of that. These are some of the documents that you, you could do that and this is what has been done in the past in major projects like that. So this is what I'm expecting. And with that, uh, I hand over to to you, uh, okay. uh, Mr. Terry Vasplata. Vasplata, that's right. Vasplata. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So uh, as, as I thought, we'll just kind of run very quickly through the first set of slides because it was just another overview of CEQA, and you've seen that before. So we won't take very long on that that material. Let's see if I can get it to change. Maybe we won't take any time at all on it. It worked <laughs> earlier. Right, take a second. Come on now. Excuse me, any of the commissioners would like to sit in the audience to see it better or is it okay to be here? Lost its mojo but there. Monitor's fine. I think, let me see how if you yeah, I used it just a bit ago. I tested it. Okay, if the monitor is okay, then we can sit oh, here. Oh well, yeah. Okay. What do you prefer? But I don't like to do like this all the time. Yeah, I know what it likes. Oh, it's, it's, it's synced up, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. It's just that it won't, for one reason or another, it won't change. Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. That's good. Okay, okay. There we go. back on track. So let's see, first, uh, first of the slides here. Mm, there we go. So a brief history of CEQA, as we all know. It's an old law, dates back to 1970. Uh, came out of the ecology movement, uh, the whole uh, idea of the big blue marble when we went to space in 68 or so was the first time that people had actually seen the Earth as a whole from a distance. Uh, and with the ecology movement, we realized that uh, it was time to do something to reduce our impacts on, on the Earth. And so following the lead of the National Environmental Policy Act in 1969, uh, California adopted CEQA. And CEQA basically is a look before you leap law. It's a law where public agencies are required to look at the decisions that are being proposed before them uh, determine whether or not there may be significant impacts resulting from those, uh, attempt to avoid those impacts either through adopting alternatives to the project or adopting mitigation measures, uh, and then making a decision whether to approve the project or not on that basis. So uh, at first, when CEQA was signed in 1970 by Ronald Reagan, uh, the man who also said, if you've seen one red, you've <laughs> seen them all, uh, it, the intent of it was apparently to apply only to public agencies' own projects. So if the city of Brisbane was building the um, basketball court and uh, skateboard ramp down there, that would have been a project that you would have looked at. Uh, if someone were proposing a subdivision, that wouldn't have been. Uh, but in 1972, there was a case called Friends of Mammoth where the California Supreme Court weighed in and actually read what the CEQA law said and said, you know, the way we read it, it says public agency actions. It doesn't say public agency activities. And so actions could be things like approvals of other projects, approvals of subdivisions, of other sorts of applications that are being made. So at that point, the law expanded greatly, uh, pretty much into what we know today. Uh, there were some major changes made to the law back in the 1970s to expand it so that it's essentially its same form. Uh, but since then, there haven't been a lot of statutory changes. Uh, how CEQA has evolved and changed over the years from being something that would require an, an environmental impact report back in the 1970s let's say 1972, looking about this big, uh, to one today where it might be that big, uh, is primarily case law. It's been hun literally hundreds of court cases that have come down over the years interpreting the various parts of CEQA uh, and how they apply in different sorts of situations. So it hasn't necessarily been that the law itself has evolved, because the law, if you look at it, looked at it from, I would say, the late 1970s to today, there's not a whole lot of difference, but it's the way that it's been interpreted by these hundreds of court cases over the years. Let me go to the next one. Uh, so what is CEQA? It's a process. It isn't a permit. So it's a process of evaluating a particular project, uh, determining what its potential impacts are, uh, adopting mitigation measures to avoid those, or alternatively, simply denying the project, uh, or approving the no project alternative, which would be the same as denying the project. It doesn't establish any particular regulations. Uh, it doesn't establish any particular study methods. It uh, doesn't establish uh, thresholds for determining whether or not something is significant. It simply provides this process. So the, the tough things, the things that most people are looking for, some sort of a standard, for example, as to, you know, is this a significant impact or not, you won't find that in CEQA itself. 
uh, if you're looking for something along the lines of, well, what is the standard method of analyzing um, aesthetics or visual impacts, you won't find that in SEEK, but it doesn't have any of those things. It simply, for the most part, lays out a process to follow, and it's left to professional judgment, uh, to consultants, uh, etc., to come up with what, how they're going to go about doing these and coming up with the methodologies that will be used. So we can have the next slide. Uh, CEQA doesn't prescribe, oh, thank you, it doesn't prescribe an outcome. Uh, it might be the worst project in the world, but if there are good reasons to approve it, the city or county can go ahead and approve it. Uh, on the other hand, it could be a very good project, but for other reasons, perhaps it's not consistent with the general plan or something like that, the uh, city can choose to deny it. So uh, no matter what the environmental impact report says, it's still left up to the city to decide whether or not, wants, whether or not it wants to approve or deny a project. Uh, CEQA requires there to be reasonable disclosure, but the courts have held over the years that absolute perfection isn't required, absolute perfection. So uh, that means that the document can have minor flaws in it. There could be misspellings, those sorts of things, not a big deal. Uh, it could also have flaws that relate to um, the actual facts that are presented in the environmental impact report, so long as those flaws aren't important enough to be prejudicial. In other words, if there were minor flaws, you can still understand what it's saying. Uh, it didn't make a difference in how you went about making your decision. Uh, the courts have tended to uh, allow agencies to go forward with those sorts of, uh, those sorts of problems. There are usually technical reports on a big project like this that support the environmental impact report. There's a traffic studies. There, in this case, there'll be hazardous, uh, hazardous materials analyses. There'll be um, air quality analyses, uh, all sorts of things, noise analyses. Uh, all of those studies will be summarized, usually summarized, and packaged together into this environmental impact report. And then the technical reports themselves will be available for the public and for decision makers to read if they want. Uh, agency has to describe all of the significant effects that might come out of the out of the project. Uh, CEQA isn't intended to be, um, what would you call it, isn't intended to be a bright and sunny law. Uh, it's intended to be a gloomy sort of a law. It's intended to tell you what are the potential impacts that are adverse uh, about this project. We don't necessarily care about what its benefits are in an environmental impact report. We're focusing in on what are the bad things that will potentially come out of this project. We could have a lot of traffic, we'll create air quality problems, so on and so forth, and then what can we do to try and avoid those? So it has to go through all the potential impacts and talk about how they might be avoided, and then as I said, it leaves up to the decision makers whether or not to approve the project. Uh, CEQA requires that agencies mitigate to the extent that's feasible. So as long as it's legal to do so, uh, as long as your powers allow you to do so, uh, you as a city are required to impose mitigation measures that would attempt to reduce or avoid the impacts that the project might otherwise have. Um, it doesn't give an agency any new powers. So if, you're, if you don't have the power to, um, uh, I don't know, package up all the uh, hazardous materials into a rocket ship and fire them off to the moon, uh, CEQA doesn't give you the power to do that either. Uh, it's within your own regulatory powers that these mitigation measures have to come from. Also, it allows other agencies who are going to be using this same EIR to use their regulatory powers as well. So when you see a big project like this one, there are going to be a variety of different agencies that will have to make approvals of it uh, if it's approved, and each one of those agencies will apply their own regulatory powers to it. So it would be, in this case, the city, it'll be the Department of Toxic Substances Control, it'll be the county, uh, it will be the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, I don't know, I don't recall if they're having a new interchange, but they were having an interchange onto the freeway, there would be Caltrans. So every, every agency down the line that would potentially have um, approval over the project or some aspect of the project gets to apply their regulations to it as well and their powers. And so hopefully with the combination of all of those, uh, each of them applying mitigation, um, the theory is that it should be able to avoid impact, or if it can't, agencies have tried the best they could, they could and the EIR discloses that these are significant unavoidable impacts despite the best efforts of the various agencies. So a typical process of preparing an EIR, this first step, the notice of preparation, has already been done. Uh, the notice of preparation is simply a, a notice to let people and other agencies know that the city is going to prepare an EIR for this project. There's a minimum 30-day review period. Comments are received, as they have been, and then those comments are reflected in the draft environmental impact report that's being put together right now. 
draft environmental impact report is really the key document. It is what people will be reviewing when, uh, once it goes out for review. It's the one that discloses the impacts, uh, talks about what the uh, environmental setting is right now, talks about what things might be like when the project is there, uh, and the difference between those being the impacts, talks about the mitigation measures, alternatives, all, all of those sorts of things. So it'll be out for a review period of 120 days, and you can expect that people are going to uh, have their opinions and their uh, facts behind them as they, as they comment on this. Uh, the key thing about commenting is that it's, it's difficult on a project like this to comment primarily because these draft EIRs tend to be intimidating. They're often very, very large documents uh, and they can often have a number of technical studies that accompany them. Uh, so what I generally suggest that people do is to take a look at the executive summary. There's always an executive summary in every EIR. Uh, take a look at the project description uh, and work from those. Look at the project description. Does it really seem to adequately describe what this project is, all the aspects of the project? Um, you know, construction, uh, operations, uh, if there remediation, does it talk about in general what the remediation is going to be like? And then look at the executive summary. Uh, what are the impacts that are identified in the executive summary? Do those appear to be the same impacts that I think it would have? Uh, and if they're not the same, do the impacts that I think it would have, have they been adequately addressed in, in the EIR and does that satisfy what I think it, it should have done? Uh, as far as the technical reports go, uh, those are difficult to judge because as I mentioned, CEQA doesn't have any particular standard. Uh, it's generally done to professional standards and each project's a little bit different than every other project and uh, the particular characteristics of the project can drive what the uh, what the studies will do. For example, if it's traffic, there's several different ways of looking at traffic, several different traffic models that can be applied to a project. There are models that are used primarily for looking at traffic be as it travels between intersections. There are models that focus in on um, levels of service at intersections. Uh, it may be that your environmental analysis is going to use two kinds of models so that you get that, that whole spectrum. Uh, but it will vary dep depending on the type of project. Air quality as well. Um, there are a variety of different air quality models, as uh, we'll show a little bit later what the names of some of them are. Uh, but depending on what the project is, how extensive its um, construction period might be, uh, you may use different models uh, for the same project uh, in order to be able to encapsulate what its potential impacts are. Mm -hmm. uh, a project with um, a remediation that's been going that will be going on will analyze the air quality potentially air quality impacts of remediation activities. And that would probably use yet a, uh, another sort of uh, methodology, probably one that's not all that common uh, to most EIRs. Uh, so those are the sorts of things that will appear in the draft EIR. And it's up to uh, other agencies, the public, uh, to offer their comments. This is their opportunity to, to weigh in on the, on the draft EIR, uh, what they think is good about it, you know, what they think is adequately analyzed, what they think hasn't been adequately analyzed. And then from that, uh, it's the city's responsibility to uh, put together what's called the final EIR. And the final environmental impact report is essentially the draft, uh, plus all the comments that were received, the written responses to those comments. And the written responses aren't simply, uh, thank you for your comment, uh, that sort of thing. They actually have to respond to every technical issue that's been raised. So if someone, for example, says, you know, I... Uh, in the traffic study, it indicates that uh, it's currently level of service A at this intersection uh, and that after the tra project is in, that it would go to level of service D and the mitigation measure is going to take it down to level of service C. Um, I don't think that any of that is correct. I've actually been sitting out on my front porch counting the cars as they go by and I don't think that it's level of service A right now because uh, in looking at some technical data, it appears that it there's just a lot more traffic on that road than level of service A, which is generally free-flowing traffic, uh, than level of service A would represent. So when you get comments like that, then the response would have to be a similar sort, similar sort of technical response. And it would take something along the lines of, uh, the traffic study has analyzed the uh, flow and also the intersections within this particular area uh, based on the standards of the city. Uh, level of service A is a level of service that's been um, identified existing right now. Uh, after running the models, level of service D uh, is what's indicated because it looks as though there'll be not only traffic from this project, but in the future traffic from other projects. Um, we are applying these particular mitigation measures, and applying those will do this to the traffic 
uh, reduce it so now it meets level of service C. So it has to be a relatively technical response mm -hmm. to those sorts of things. Uh, there is no particular standard that, that is used for these responses. Um, if the project goes into litigation, in other words, if, it, if the, someone sues the city over the adequacy of the EIR, it's going to be up to the court to decide whether or not they feel that the city has what's called substantial evidence or factual evidence to support its conclusions. Uh, the courts will not um, second guess the uh, traffic engineer, for example. They will look at the evidence in front of them, so it would be the city's traffic engineer versus uh, perhaps a traffic engineer or someone who's alleging that the traffic hasn't been adequately analyzed, um, who's suing the city. Uh, they'll look at the evidence that both of them have, prevent, have presented to the city and then make a decision as to whether or not the city has justification for its, its determinations. But they're not going to redo anything. Uh, they're simply going to look at what's on the record. So Carolyn, did you have a question? Um, well, I had some heard some comments from someone that she had written some questions for a previous EIR, and the answers were look at uh, chapter so and so and um, mm. page so and so, which to me did not sound adequate. So, how would be the best way to to get someone to write? I, you know, I, I don't want to see that happen. If someone right. has spent a lot exactly. of time writing their opinions and then they say, you know, and the response is look at uh, section so-and-so and, and paragraphs, you know, over and over again, I, j I just wouldn't like to see that happen. Right. And that could and be a perfectly adequate, perfectly adequate uh, response. That can be. Sure. Yeah. One of the things that comes up is that when people are writing their comments, sometimes they will put them in the form of a question. And to me, mm -hmm. I never like, I, well, actually, I like to see them in the form of the question because it makes my job easier. But I don't think it's an effective way of commenting personally. Because, uh, and I've given uh, John some examples of good comments that we've received on EIRs we've worked on in the past and some uh, bad comments, not so good, ones that aren't really very well done. Uh, and you'll see that some of them, they, they simply ask questions. And so if you ask a question, well, then the answer is, look it up. Here it is. You know, did you really analyze the, the air quality? Well, yeah, we did. Look here in the air quality section, chapter 3.3. Uh, it talks all about air quality. So, but on the other hand, if you say, you know, I don't think that the air quality analysis was accurate because you used uh, this particular model in, in your air quality analysis, but we went on the website of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and it looks to us as though they're suggesting that this other sort of model be used. Uh, why haven't you used this other model? Explain to us you know, why the model that you used is an adequate model versus the model that's being suggested by the Air District. That's a more effective comment if their concern is air quality. Because that way, it forces the people like me, the consultant and the city staff, uh, to take a look and say, yeah, well, why did we use this model? Is this the right model? And then if they believe they did, and nine times out of ten, you have used the right one, um, then you have to explain, well, we used it because this is the one that's, that's accepted generally uh, for this sort of use. Uh, this particular project has these characteristics about it. Uh, we've used the model to address this particular characteristic um, that relates to this part of the project. Uh, we've actually used a separate model for this other part of the other characteristic of the project, so on and so forth. So you generally get a much better response if you don't simply ask a question, but rather if you point out what you think may be potential flaws in the document and explain why you think that they're flaws. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Makes sense. I, I, I like, that, I like that to clarify a effective. little bit about the, the traffic study you mentioned. It won't be done by the city, right? It will be done by the by the applicant uh, consultant. Well, everything that's uh, let's see. As a matter of fact, if you look at the last second to the last line here, it says that the final EIR has to reflect the independent judgment of the city. So that means that uh, whoever does the study, that that has to be um, accepted by the city as being an an adequate sub an adequate study. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if the, some cities, uh, some agencies bring in a, um, a third party uh, peer reviewer to take a look at it to see whether or not they think that it's adequate. Uh, other cities, other counties may have staff on, on hand who have adequate credentials to be able to look at it and 
determine whether or not it looks pretty good. Uh, other ones may uh, consult with other agencies uh, to see what other agencies have to say. But whatever is in the draft EIR and ends up in the final EIR has to essentially be the city's study, no matter who did it. it it's going to be the city's study. Just like the EIR, the EIR is the city's EIR. Uh, the city has to independently review it. Uh, if there's a lawsuit, it's the city that gets sued, uh, not the applicant. Uh, and so that EIR is going to reflect what the city wants to have in it. Uh, and as I say, one of the things with CEQA is that there's no particular standard. And so you're essentially relying on the uh, professional expertise of the people who've been hired. Mm -hmm. And so for the most part, uh, cities, the, their consultants will hire who they think are the, the best people for the particular job. Uh, so a traffic engineer, whoever it might be. Uh, you generally, for example, on a project like this, if, if, um, you know, if I were working on it, I wouldn't hire a very small uh, one-man civil engineering firm to do the traffic study. You know, we would hire some uh, well-known traffic engineers who uh, specialize in traffic studies to do the traffic study, uh, particularly someone who may work in the Bay Area all the time so that they're, they're knowledgeable about uh, what professional practice is in the Bay Area. Uh, they're knowledgeable about where to find information about traffic, all of that sort of thing. Now, Terry, if I, if I could just interject um, in regard to the chair's question, the EIR consultant, the traffic studies being done by a sub-consultant to the city, so the, the traffic studies actually being prepared under contract to the city, we're not relying on the developer's uh, prepared traffic study. So there will be a parallel study on the EIR that uh, the applicant is going to submit well, that, that will be their own study and we're going to do a separate study? The applicant did some traffic work in support of their own planning program uh, and that's certainly in the record and um, our EIR consultants had access, access to that but they prepared their own traffic study. The, our city consultant did. Yeah, I think that's a very <clears throat> very important point because uh, <clears throat> we, we had to make sure that uh, if the city is going to endorse it, then that should have the proper analysis done, whether it's, whether it's by the city's own consultant or somebody reviews it. And in this particular respect, the the planning commission will have to have the you know the some kind of a input to to that particular process as to who did that and how it was done uh, to to make a, a recommendation to the city council. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So these are the basic contents that you'll see in the draft EIR, table of contents, executive summary. Uh, one thing that's missing out of here, I'm sorry, is the project description. It'll also be a probably a chapter with the project description. And then uh, it'll have this list of preparers so that you know who prepared it. Although everything that's cited will have references, so there'll be actual references in there so that if someone wants to, they can go uh, look up the references that were used. And then if there are technical appendices, traffic studies, et cetera, uh, those, would, those are generally attached as uh, separate appendices to the draft EIR too. So that's what makes the big intimidating package. And then the public gets involved in this because they, they can review the notice of preparation and comment. They can comment on the draft EIR. They can come to meetings and give either verbal or written comments uh, that way. Uh, they can come to the city the planning commission meeting that will be held on the draft EIR, they can come to the city count, the planning commission, I should say, and the city council meetings on the project itself. Uh, and at any of those times, uh, they can submit either their verbal uh, or where it's not an open meeting but just a review period or their written comments. And that would include email comments as well. Email comments count just uh, as uh, ones that come in by letter or delivered by hand would be. Let's see what else. Oh, so program EIR. Uh, we already know what the purpose of an EIR is. It's to disclose all these potential impacts. Um, there's, the CEQA works on this idea of one project, one EIR. So the one EIR is done for even a very large project like this to start off with. And it's often called a program EIR because it's a large project. It's something that's going to occur over a long period of time as it's built out. There'll be a number of different agencies considering a number of different uh, potential approvals for the project over a period of time. Uh, and so one EIR is done, recognizing that it's going to be the framework for these later decisions. Uh, each of the other agencies that come along in their, 
you know, uh, along this path towards approval, uh, each of those agencies will also use the same EIR. Uh, unless there's some compelling reason for them to have to update the EIR, they're required to use the same one. So this one that's done for the Baylands uh, will be the foundation for the approval by the Department of Toxic Substances Control, by the Regional Water Board, by the county, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, simply because there's an EIR that's been done for this project and the city, let's say if the city approves the project and if the city uh, feels this EIR is adequate and certifies it, simply because the city has approved the project with an EIR doesn't mean those other agencies have to approve it. Each agency has its own responsibilities, its own authorities, and each of them is free to either approve or deny the project. Each of them is also free to add its own conditions of approval if it feels that it must need additional conditions uh, that even perhaps ones that even aren't listed as mitigation measures in the EIR uh, if necessary to meet their, uh, their responsibilities under their particular law. Uh, Karen, did you have a question? Um, I, I do have a question. I'm not sure who the question really goes to. Um, one project, one EIR, fair comment. However, on this particular property, um, for, for those of us who go back many years looking at it, it seems that you know different areas within this piece of property are completely separate and different to the others, and each part of this property has different uh, situations going on. More toxins here, different types of toxins there, um, endangered habitat or whatever it might be, restoring creeks, all different kinds of things. So how are we, I, I think the question maybe more goes to, doesn't go to you, John? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as we're all ducking, I'm, everyone's ducking. I haven't even heard it. Everybody's yet. ducking. It's great. That's okay. Um, so, given that, from 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 my perspective, from what I know about the property, uh, after being involved with various groups over the years looking at it, how do we say one project, one EIR, and then encompass that to this entire project, which has all of these? different subsets like a jigsaw puzzle. This piece doesn't have any relationship to that piece over there. Right. And that's why EIRs are so big. Oh, good. Because, because they do have to take a comprehensive look at the whole property. They have to look at the entire project. Mm -hmm. And they have to look at how the project would change the property and what potential adverse impacts might come out of those changes. So if the project is going to be, um, I don't know, putting homes in an area that would potentially is currently um, contaminated, uh, it would take a look at, well, what sort of mitigation measures are necessary, what sort of remediation has to be done before this can be allowed. Uh, it would disclose all of that sort of stuff, uh, and so on and so forth. So the portions that, that have habitat, for example, would tend to get uh, greater discussion in the biological resources section. Uh, areas that have hazardous materials on them would probably uh, get greater discussion in a safety section or hazard section of mm -hmm. the EIR. So the various portions of the EIR, the various impact sections of the EIR, will discuss each one of these particular areas of the project. And then they will also talk about, since this is one project, they'll also talk about how those things might relate to various parts of the project, too. So that's one reason why the EIRs are so big. Got it. Now, one of the things that happens on a project like this where um, it's going to take a long time to do, there's a variety of very technical sorts of things that have to be done first if it's going to actually come to fruition. Uh, agencies outside the city are going to be working on some very technical issues. Uh, this is what's called a program EIR. So it will provide the foundation for analysis, but it may not go into the, the greatest level of detail on all of these issues and doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, those other agencies may have greater expertise uh, they may have uh, studies that they're going to do somewhere down the line. Uh, and so if they're, you know, as their uh, approval process w goes forward and it's time for them to make a decision either to approve or not to approve the project, uh, they will then be subject to CEQA again, but in a, a more limited way than this original project has been. So the original EIR will stand as sort of a foundation for later... Um, 
what could be called subsequent EIRs or subsequent negative declarations for aspects of the project for which there's new information that becomes available to these other agencies or even to the city at some future time. Uh, or there's a revision to the project, perhaps. Uh, or there might be uh, changes in the circumstances. Uh, maybe a new endangered species is listed that, that wasn't listed before. And so those three things, changes in the project, changes in the circumstances, new information, those have to be taken into account by these other agencies as they're making their decisions. And if things have changed that indicate that there's a new impact or the impact's more severe than this original EIR said, then they will prepare what's called a subsequent EIR. Or if they can avoid those impacts, a subsequent mitigated negative declaration and it will essentially add on to this original program EIR. Okay, does that make sense? That's the idea. Did you start out with one EIR for a project? Very, in a big project like this, it's going to be a very comprehensive, large EIR on lots and lots of different topics. Big sections. Each one of the impact sections is going to be pretty big, uh, I would wager. Uh, and then as time goes by and other agencies have to step forward to make a decision on the project, they're still subject to CEQA, and if there's something new that pops up, they'll have to analyze that. They would have to do another smaller EIR on that particular issue or set of issues, uh, go through the CEQA process just as has been done with this EIR, and then with that smaller EIR and the program EIR in hand, uh, make their decision on the project, either approve or deny. Okay. Okay? Yep. No. So. As I say, that's one reason why these, on a big project, that's why the EIRs turn out to be so big. And that's why you have lots and lots of technical studies sometimes on, right. on so, these EIRs. So you are sectioning it within the one screen. Right. Within the one EIR, there will typically be, well, there's going to be a section that talks about the project description, and it will talk about the various phases of the project. We'll talk about the various areas on the site. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be separate sections. I don't know how many, but there'll be separate sections, usually more than 10. Um, usually less than 20, but somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, they're talking about uh, visual impacts, air quality, biological resources, so on and so forth down the line. Uh, and each one of those is going to talk about what, how is the project going to affect what's already out there right now. So air quality, it's not going to be necessarily air quality on the site, but it's going to be the regional air quality. How will this, this project and the emissions that it would potentially produce affect regional air quality within the Bay Area? Uh, biology, that's probably going to be what's on the site. How would building a particular thing on the particular biology that's on the site, how will that affect the site? What would the potential impact of that be? And so it'll go through point by point all of those areas. Okay. One thing to look for as you're, as you're reviewing an EIR and commenting on it is does it look as though there's anything that isn't in there? Because uh, oftentimes EIRs are put together sort of with this, this standard list that's in the back of the CEQA guidelines. There's 16 or 17 different resource areas or issue areas that are identified there. And those tend to be the ones that EIR preparers use, uh, but there may be other issues. And so it's always worthwhile, you know, kind of thinking, put your thinking cap on as you're reading through, oh, yeah, you know, they talked about water quality, but what about this aspect of water quality? Is that in there? That's of interest to me. So that might be something to, to bore down into. I have a follow-up question regarding uh -huh. the, you know, the, the how to make how the planning commission make a decision. Now, the first the, the one the EIR report is prepared by the applicant. Then we have the consultants on board that will be reviewing and doing the the whole portions of that EIR also. Like for example, traffic study that uh, our city consultant. And then there are the public, uh, you know, they will be making the comments. Now, in in doing the, in making the decision, um, is is our, our decision going to sway more towards what the, the, uh, the city consultant is saying? Or we have to judge all, all of those comments together and come up with our own recommendation based on that? Because, uh, you know, the city is spending money and time to have a consultant to do a detailed study. And are we supposed to just rely on that or review his report as well as the original report prepared by the applicant as well as all the other responsible agencies and combine all that together and come up with our own recommendation? That's the part that will be 
the one that would be difficult for us, all of us, right. to figure it out. Yeah, and, and I like no to, real... I like you to yeah. see how it's being done. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that in the in the other major projects based on your? Yeah, there's no simple answer, but for the most part, the thing to keep in mind is that this EIR is the city's EIR, and you're the city's planning commission. Mm -hmm. So you should be relying primarily on the information that's there in the EIR. What you'll be looking for, what you should be looking for, I think, in my opinion, is um, has someone presented some evidence to us, some information? Have they presented some information to us that looks as though what we have done in the EIR is not adequate for one reason or another. Uh, we had the biological survey that was done. Um, are they suggesting that perhaps there are other species that are on the site that haven't been analyzed? Uh, and so we would take, you might take a look at what it has under the biological resources analysis and see whether or not those species were covered. Um, but as I say, I would depend primarily on what the consultant has done in the EIR because that's the city's EIR. Yeah, you have to use some caution in, in dealing with environmental impact reports because if there's a, a risk of litigation, there's a risk the city is going to get sued over the project. Uh, anything that you say or do, as they say on TV, uh, anything that you say or do uh, in your public, you know, in your public uh, forum here uh, can kind of be held against you in, in law. And Unless we take fifth. <laughs> yeah, so you have, to be, you have to be careful about what you say. Um, because what the court will look at will be what's called the administrative record. And that's essentially what has happened from the beginning of this process until the time that the city council uh, closes the hearing on the, the environmental impact report and certifies the environmental impact report and then goes on to make its decision. So it could be years. It's a year's worth of all of the things that have happened. It's the applications that came in. It's the information submitted by the, cl uh, the applicant. It's the um, environmental impact report that was put together by the city and its consultants. Uh, it was letters that came in from other people. Uh, it's information provided by other agencies. The administrative record includes all of that. Uh, and it also includes any testimony or any discussion that's been done by the decision makers, such as yourselves, Planning Commission, City Council. Uh, and so there have been some cases where a, a Planning Commission, for example, the City of Sacramento Planning Commission, um, was was very good about going through uh, a particular project and saying, well, you know, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good, this is not good. When the city ended up getting sued, that's what the court looked at and said, well, you know, the planning commission said this didn't look very good, and so we're going to hold against the city. When the city council, the, the main mistake the city made was that the city council hadn't looked, hadn't really looked at what the planning commission's recommendation was and said, well, you know, planning commission is actually wrong here, and this is why, mm -hmm. and we don't agree with them here, and this is why. If they had come back and said what the city policies were and why the Planning Commission's discussion was incorrect, that might have been okay. But they didn't, and so what was on the record was what the Planning Commission said. So it's not just the Planning Commission. It could be the, the city staff. Um, it could be anybody. So you have to be careful with, about what you say about the project and how you go about re reviewing these sorts of things. But as I say, primarily when, you know, when I look at these uh, things, when I'm doing a peer review, for example, of somebody else's environmental impact report, I tend to, um, I can't, I guess I, the word is trust. I tend to trust what's in the environmental impact report. I come in with an open mind. Uh, and it's only what I primarily look for is whether or not there might be holes, whether there might be things that they didn't quite analyze. Um, and so those are what concern me more than, um, you know, which traffic model they used or any of that sort of thing, because I can't really judge that. I don't really, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, and so what I primarily look for is, well, you know, they didn't, looks like they did an adequate job of the traffic analysis. They've covered all the streets. Uh, but, you know, there's an interchange that's only two blocks away, and I don't see it anywhere that they analyzed in the traffic study. To me, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. So those are the sorts of things that, if I were on the yeah. planning commission, I would look for, things that appear to be inadequately analyzed in, in the EIR. And you don't necessarily have to have expertise in any of them uh, to know that. Now, people will come before you and, you know, the people can allege anything they want about the EIR, about uh, what the um, motives might be uh, of the EIR preparers. Uh, but that's not necessarily for you to judge. The, the main thing that you might take away from testimony is whether or not they've brought up a good point. You know, what do you know? Yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe it didn't quite cover the, this as much as it might have. 
and it's reasonable to expect that, that an EIR covers this. It doesn't require uh, us undertaking 20 years of study in order to come up with an answer, uh, but it's something that could be reasonably done. Uh, so those are the sorts of things that I would listen for in the testimony as well. Because uh, people will, you know, as anybody does, people always want to present their own view, uh, and they'll, they may argue strongly for a point of view, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the EIR is inadequate. It simply means that they have a different point of view. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is, again, this whole idea of uh, ending up in court. It's not a nice thing, but that's, what, that's kind of what um, people worry about when, when they have a big project like this. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that the court is limited to just that administrative record. So they're looking at all the stuff that was presented to the Planning Commission, the City Council, all the things that came in during this uh, long period of analyzing the project. They won't be taking, um, they won't be taking any information uh, that comes outside the record. So if, if um, you know, it wouldn't have a, wouldn't be like one of the TV shows, one of the lawyer shows on TV where they, they pull the chairman of the planning commission up and they've got him there on the stand and pretty soon you're sweating and they're asking you these questions and you don't know and, you know, they don't do that. They're, there's nothing like that. It's simply the judge and the, the two sets of attorneys arguing over this set of, of information that's there. Some alleging that these are facts and these should be followed. Some alleging that these are facts and that's what should be followed. And what the court is going to do is not necessarily weigh the facts, but determine whether or not the city had information in front of it that supports its conclusions. So other people can have their own opinion. If there's a difference in opinion, that doesn't mean the EIR is wrong. It means that there's a difference of opinion. The EIR has to bring forth differences of opinion but it doesn't necessarily have to reconcile them. There could be two sets of opinion. You don't have to reconcile them. You simply have to have uh, factual uh, evidence that supports what the city is doing, what the city's conclusions are. Okay, so if the city concludes that uh, traffic impacts are going to be less than significant uh, and it has used a proper methodology, that would probably be okay. It would probably survive a court challenge, uh, even though someone may argue that it's you know, it's, there's going to be a significant impact on traffic, okay? Because they're going to look to see what's in the record. Mm -hmm. And if there's evidence, you know, factual evidence that supports the city, the, the courts will tend to go in the direction of the city. If there are holes, that's what the courts will say. Well, you know, city, you should have studied this more. So that's why when I, when I look at these documents, I try and look for the things that I think are missing because those are the, the areas that will trip the city up. Very good point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's program EIRs. They have the same stuff that a regular EIR has, but as I say, they tend to take a broader view. Uh, there'll be alternatives. One of them is no project. The, the city can choose uh, to adopt one of the alternatives in place of the project if if they chose to. Um, EIRs don't require that the alternatives be looked at the same level as of detail as the project itself. Uh, but uh, Brisbane has chosen to look at this uh, community-based alternative at the same level as the as the project. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, ER doesn't have to examine every possible alternative. It may be that people will suggest additional alternatives. Well, why don't we do this? You know, this is a totally different alternative. Nobody's thought of this one yet. I think that this should be the alternative that that is included in the EIR. Uh, and CEQA basically says that the city has to look at a reasonable range of alternatives. You don't have to look at every alternative, and you don't have to look at alternatives that are similar to one another. So if someone in, you know, comes before you and says, well, look, I've, I've spent some time, I've put together a completely new alternative. Uh, if you look at that and it appears to be close to the community-based alternative, you don't have to include it. Uh, on the other hand, if they have come up with an alternative, that meets the cr same criteria that were used to select the alternatives in the EIR, that might be a hole in the EIR. So it might be something that needs to be considered for addition to the EIR. Can you s go through that okay. again? Sure. But is that what, coming to us? Who, who would, they would, somebody might... That would be a decision us? that would tend to be made by the city attorney. But, but someone, at the, at the public hearings, people can submit all kinds of things. So they could submit, for example, a, their own biological survey that they've done. Right, I've and, and so look. where we do could, we go so from there? We could suggest okay. another alternative that isn't in the EIR. Uh, I sat down at my kitchen table with uh, the Crayola crayons that my child had left there, uh, and on the back of a sheet of paper, um, I traced out the outlines of the project, 
and I've decided that you know, commercial should be over here instead of over there, and this is going to be a park over here, they could present you with a full-blown alternative to the project. So, in, in I, I think that was the same question. What do we do with that? We right. Don't make and so that. you don't make a decision on that. We hand that. Right. The decision the would be, is this alternative, or the consideration would be, is this alternative similar to what we've looked at already? <coughs> and if it is, then that's fine. Uh, or is this alternative something that is different than what we've looked at before and still meets the criteria for alternatives to be analyzed in an EIR? And these are the criteria that the alternative meets most or all of the project objectives, and the objectives will be laid right out in the project description. There'll be a discrete heading that says objectives. Meets most or all of the project objectives, uh, is potentially feasible, uh, so it wouldn't be a moon colony or something like that. It's potentially feasible. Uh, and then finally, it reduces one or more of the project impacts, substantially reduces one or more of the project impacts. So it could be that, you know, in the discussion, um, what generally happens is that the city attorney and or city staff, uh, consultants, uh, will take a look at the anything that comes in before you, and they will probably, assuming, probably let you know, they'll give you the high sign, this looks like something new, and it looks as though it's something that we may want to take a longer look at, uh, because it may mean that we have to what's called recirculate the EIR. In other words, include this in the EIR and send that portion of the EIR back out for public review. Okay, that's a way of kind of repairing the holes the f that are in the fabric of the EIR before the EIR is finalized. But if it is presented at the public hearing, then all we do is hand it over to the staff for the further review or? Right, I would give it to staff for, for their review, yeah. Because it's- We it, don't make the decision. You it. want to be careful not to make a snap yeah. decision on these things, right. That's what yeah, because well, that's yeah. one of the areas that, again, it kind of gets into the whole idea of litigation and into the, the, the uh, potential areas that someone will attempt to sue the city about. Sure. Is so how, how do we, we handle presented it? an alternative and it wasn't included Leave in the to EIR, the therefore the ER is inadequate. So what I have done in the past with uh, other clients is that uh, when we get that sort of a thing, we've called a timeout uh, or a brief recess during the commission meeting, and I don't know how you want to handle it, but that's one way of doing it, uh, in order for staff and others to take a look at it and see whether or not it meets those three criteria uh, and whether it's something that, yeah, we need, we need to think about recirculating this portion of the EIR because they've presented us with a good alternative. <laughs> if, I, if I could, I, I'd offer that I would expect that kind of comment, someone proposing an alternative in the public comment period. Uh, mm -hmm and whatever justification rationale um, it's would be in a, in a way treated like any other comment on the EIR um, because you go through an exercise that Terry discussed as part of the response to comment I don't I, I wouldn't expect that anyone would uh, in in a 15 minute recess in a hearing decide that yeah we're gonna um, you know restructure the EIR process. That would be a comment that would be subject to response, formal response, and, and then the commission would review both the original comment, the city's response to uh, whether that comment is, you know, whatever the city um, response is to that comment, and that might then lead to a, a recirculation or whatever, but that would be kind of part of that larger process of accepting comments and responding to comments. Right. May I have a question? For staff, speaking the microphones. Is, is, is on. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, are is are we going to during the CIR process? Are we going to have the city attorney present at the meetings or not? You'll have him uh, here on hearings where you're actually deliberating and taking testimony. I don't believe he would be monitoring meetings you have to accept public comments. Right. When meetings, that's all you're going to be doing is accepting public comment. There's no deliberation on your part, no action on your part. I wouldn't expect the city attorney would be present. Right, that's a good point. That, that we should distinguish between uh, the meeting that you're going to hold during the time that the draft EIR comments are being accepted versus the, the hearing that you'll, you'll hold on the project itself. During the, the meeting on the draft EIR, 
you won't be you won't be responding to any of these comments that come in. It's for purposes of allowing people to offer their verbal comments or turn in written comments, but it's not really for you to make a decision or anything like that about what's coming in. This is simply a, another forum or another opportunity for people to submit their comments. So rather than simply being able to mail them in or email them in, uh, they can actually come in and offer verbal comments and talk to real people uh, rather than just putting it out for the mailman or for some electronic wizard to carry off. Um, so that, that, that will be your role at that point. You're, just, you're basically just listeners. But what I'm talking about or what I was talking about was that other hearing that you'll hold where you're actually taking deliberation on it. And John's right. It, it, again, even at that point, it's still kind of considered comments, and it's just something that you have to consider. Um, and it may be part of your recommendation. It may not be. But uh, it'll be something that, that will be up to the city council to decide. Now, in the public uh, comments time, the first one, where somebody raises the questions, we just listen to it and don't respond? I, I believe that's what you're going to want, right? I think uh, there's some discussion in Terry's presentation later that kind of talks about some of these issues, but uh, yeah. uh, the short answer is, yeah, we would not anticipate. There's not going to be an ongoing dialogue in a public. Um, there be certain. There can be different kind of meetings. There can be informational meetings about what's in the EIR, and then there can be meetings where there uh, testimonies being offered. And I think Terry can will be walking through some of some of those. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes what happens is that a citizen will come and say, "I demand this, uh, blah blah blah," and I want the answer from the planning commission. Yeah. Right. And at that point, uh, you know, when we are taking the comments, we don't respond to to his inquiry. At right. And so the thing is that you need to explain that to people at the beginning of the of the yeah. meeting. Explain to them that we're here to take your comments. We're here to. Um, you know, offer a different forum for your comments to be received, uh, but our job isn't to respond to any of your comments because we're we're in the draft EIR process, and when we prepare the final EIR, all of those comments will be responded to. And part of it is is that you can't simply respond to comments on a, a document that you're not completely familiar with. Um, you can't respond to comments necessarily off the cuff. Uh, it takes time to think about what your response might be in order to give people um, a comprehensive and adequate response. So um, at that meeting, it's not going to be your role to, to respond to their comments. Okay. Or even to offer uh, value judgments or anything for that matter. You so, just listen, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so uh, that's something that people don't always understand because they may want to talk about the project too. They may ob they object to the project, they don't like the project, or maybe they love the project and they want to talk about the project. But at that particular meeting, you're not there necessarily to talk about the project. You're there to take testimony on the environmental impact report. So if you have comments on the environmental impact report, that's what we want to hear from you now. If you have objections to the project, that's well and good, but please you know, come back to us when we have the actual hearing on it and we'll, we'll, we can listen to that then. And the city council can listen to that then. Because this, that, Draft EIR meeting is going to be simply to take comments on the draft EIR. So that's something that you'll let people know right up front. Now, this isn't the usual sort of planning commission meeting that we have. Our purpose here is to offer people a, a, the opportunity to appear in front of us and give us verbal comments, or if you want, give us your comments in writing about the adequacy uh, or inadequacy of this draft EIR. Okay. Thank you. And so uh, this is significance determinations. We all know that we have to have significant impacts identified. Um, there are different types of thresholds of significance. In other words, uh, you know, standards that would be used to determine whether or not something is significant. Some of them are quantitative air emissions, for example. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District has uh, particular levels of emissions from projects that they consider to be significant if they're exceeded. Uh, there are other things that are qualitative. Visual impact, for example, there's no way to put numbers on visual impact, or at least not very easily. Uh, impact on cultural resources, really not a way of putting numbers on that. So those are going to be more or less qualitative. Um, but in either case, that's more or less how the sig how significance is determined. And then mitigation measures, again, these uh, this idea of having to adopt measures that will be part of the project. Before you oh, go to mm -hmm. that sure. session, the, regarding the qualitative say, uh, you know, significance, mm -hmm. how are we going to judge that? Uh, whether, you know, we again, we're going to rely on the city's consultant? 
Right, in general, right. Yeah, you would rely on the consultant. And there's different methods for, for looking at these things qualitatively. Uh, historic resources, for example, if the project were to uh, destroy historic resources, that's considered to be a significant effect. Um, so uh, well, what I'm talking about is visual impact is one layer. thing that's very difficult to, right. to assess. And uh, in that particular case, we will have to rely on the city's consultant, right. I guess. Right, as to what the degree of, of impact might be. And then also to what degree it can be mitigated. You know, how, uh, how effective would mitigation be? Because each, so each one of us will have our own opinion also right. regarding the significant that's impact. True. And that's what uh, my question is as to, as to how we're going to, in the final analysis, how we're going to determine right. whether there was a significant uh, visual impact or not. Yeah, I don't it's know. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. Yeah, the qualitative ones are the hardest. Okay, so mitigation measures. Um, they have to adopt mitigation measures if the project would have a significant impact. They have to be feasible. They have to be fully enforceable. Um, so one of the things to look through when you're a planning commissioner is to look at the mitigation measure and say, well, how would I go about mi implementing this? Is it written clearly enough that it's understandable to, to the average person? Uh, so they could actually put this mitigation measure into into effect. Um, that's the main thing. And does it matter that the cost is uh, taken into account too? Or? Cost would be taken into account, yeah. It, it says feasible, and one part of feasible is cost, uh, whether or not it's economically feasible. Uh, and so, um, you know, again, it's going to be up to the city to decide whether or not they think that the cost would be uh, a cost that's bearable. And that's yeah. also... It doesn't necessarily have to be cheap. I mean, it may be that the mitigation will be expensive. But that's also subjective, right? I mean, how, but that's, how are you going to... That's relatively subjective as well. Yeah. Now, it's generally difficult uh, for an applicant to get out from underneath mitigation measures by arguing that it's, that it's infeasible because of economic reasons. Uh, they would actually have to have some evidence that indicates why it's infeasible. Um, so that doesn't happen very often, that someone says, oh, that's just economically infeasible. I can't do that many It has happened in many <laughs> it does happen over here. Now and yeah. again. Yeah. People have argued that it's too expensive. We right. can't do that. But if, if they argue that, then they have to show why it's too expensive. You know, because yeah. the city has to make a finding at the end of all of this. If the, if the city council approves the project, uh, they have to make a finding that uh, gives the disposition of the mitigation measures. And if there's a mitigation measure that hasn't been adopted, and the reason is that it's economically infeasible, then the city has to explain why it's economically infeasible. And they have to have factual evidence that backs that up. So the, the thing called findings that come at the end of the process if the city council approves it, the findings can be pretty detailed, depending on what the, you know, what the disposition of each of these impacts is. And if there's you know, if the city decides not to adopt a mitigation measure, that makes that particular finding even more, you know, even even bigger, even bigger. more important. Uh, projects that I've worked on on a large project, we've had findings, you know, findings that are 100, 120 pages long, 120 pages worth of um, discussions as to well, this was what the impact was on air quality. Uh, this is how we went about mitigating it. These are why this is why the mitigation measures will be effective in reducing the air quality. Uh, it has a significant unavoidable effect. Uh, here's why we're approving the project. These are what the benefits of the project will be that outweigh the unavoidable impact on air quality. So you have to explain all of those things for each one of the impacts that the project would produce. We have two members of the audience, and one of them would like to have a, ask a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. Hi. This is not my first practice, but <laughs> can if, you, if you can come to the oh. microphone. Yeah, the more I think about these mitigation measures, and, and your next, maybe maybe I noticed that your next slide deals with this to some extent. We have, we have a, a program EIR that um, leaves a lot of details um, open. And then we have a timeline, as you say, the EIR has no, uh, uh, it, it does not cease to be, um, uh, does not cease to hold just because 20 or 30 or 40 years has passed since it was adopted or certified. 
So it, it, you have you have you have details that haven't been that haven't that haven't been firmed up, and then you have this extended timeline. So you may you may get into a position where these mitigation measures. You know, you're 30 years past the date that the EIR has been certified, and you still haven't um, come up with, you still don't have uh, detailed mitigation measures for a particular, for a particular project uh, or for a particular aspect of the project. What can, you, what can be done in the EIR so that the mitigation is, if the project's going to go for so that the mitigation is an ongoing effort and that you don't just let this stuff hang, that these mitigation, these aspects of mitigation hang for decades and decades. Yeah. Uh, the answer is that the mitigation measures have to be written proactively with the idea that this is going to be a long-term, long-term project. Um, this, if, assuming that this particular aspect of the project, the, the impact that's being mitigated is going to be an impact that takes a long time to mitigate. Mitigation measure needs to talk about that. It needs to include um, contingencies. Uh, you know, in, at the end of one year, we expect this to have occurred. If it has not happened, then we'll undertake this. Um, we're going to monitor again at the end of two years, and if this hasn't happened, then we're going to undertake that. Mm -hmm. uh, the mitigation measures have to be designed so that they take into account this long-term activity and provide a framework. Now, the way that the courts have interpreted this, again, uh, this isn't something that's in the CEQA law itself, but it's actually come out of these various court interpretations, is that uh, an EIR can defer some of the details of a, of a mitigation measure, provided that the city is, number one, committing to mitigation. In other words, they're adopting a mitigation measure. Uh, number two, that they're performance standards that are laid out. In other words, this is what the mitigation measure is going to do. Uh, we haven't described exactly how we're going to get there, but these are the things that have to be accomplished by the mitigation measure. Or alternatively, that there be a menu of mitigation measures. Uh, we haven't selected the mitigation measure yet, but here are three different ways that we could do it, and the applicant uh, can choose one of those three, because any one of those three would be adequate. We simply haven't chosen between them. It's another option. And then finally, um, have to be able to show that this um, mitigation measure has, has some objective criteria for measuring that it's going to be successful. So those are the, the various components that all fit together into a mitigation measure so that it it can be, uh, quote unquote, deferred. In other words, it doesn't it isn't developed down to the nth detail, but instead provides a framework for this mitigation to be developed over time. So, Karen, did you have a question? Yeah, re relative to the mitigation measures that could go out 30 years, say. So if we have in our EIR that X, Y, and or Z will be part of the mitigation of whatever it is, we all know that as time goes by, um, a lot of mitigation of, of things that are like out on the Baylands change dramatically is that verbiage encompassed in what we're doing? So as technology changes, science changes relative to mitigation, that it's, it's, it's not an, you know, we, we signed off on this and we're stuck with that, that, oh, this great new thing came up and these bugs eat that stuff, um, that that can be part, brought in as part of the mitigation measure. I mean, because this, this stuff is changing every single day because there's a lot of this stuff around the world that right. people are working on. Yeah, I don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer to that because the longer out you go, right. the farther away it is from, from your original decision and the, the less likely it is that you're able to <clears throat> project what's going to happen. And so it may not be possible, realistically, for someone to write a mitigation measure today that's really going to address things 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Well, uh, it, we can, you can attempt to provide flexibility, but it may not be possible to actually have a crystal ball and see out that far. I mean, is the other thing about it, though, is that uh, if there's an agency that has to make additional decisions 30 years from now about the project, they will have to revisit the mitigation at that point. And assuming that CEQA is still, still a law, uh, they would have to do that through the CEQA process. So they would do whatever sort of CEQA document we'd have in 30 years. Um, to analyze whether or not uh, this is still the same impact or whether it's become more severe, 
uh, whether there are mitigation measures that need to be changed, uh, and if there are, then they would have to disclose that in this, this additional environmental document, whether it's a subsequent EIR or subsequent mitigated negative declaration. Well, what if we state our goals as, you know, we're going to mitigate X and here's the goal? However we get to that goal, it right. doesn't matter whether it's under today's laws, tomorrow's laws, or laws 20 years from now. Right. Here's our That's the desired idea of, end right. goal. That's the idea of the performance standards that, that they've been talking about, that okay. the courts have talked about. The idea is that you set some sort of an objective standard uh, for this mitigation to meet. Now, the, the thing that, that um, people who write mitigation uh, have to worry about is that you provide too much flexibility and you end up with people doing things that have uh, unexpected consequences. You know, we're, we're going to, uh, here we go, Australia, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to, we're, we're, we're hunted, we've hunted out all of the, the native fauna, so we're going to bring in some rabbits uh, because we like to hunt rabbits. Well, what do you know, the rabbits over, over, overrun the entire country. Um, or uh, was it where mongoose have been brought in? Uh, some Pacific islands, they brought in mongoose because they, the mongoose were good at uh, killing poisonous snakes. Well, then the mongoose ate up all the birds. Uh, so you never know, you know, the, you have to be careful in putting the mitigation measures together too because you want to provide enough of a framework that you don't, you don't allow a monster be, to be created with the mitigation measures. Eucalyptus trees in California. Yeah, although I like eucalyptus trees, so I think those are positive. <laughs> Now, is it possible in the EIR that you can have a timeline for, you know, that every five years you look at that uh, particular aspect, say, say the hazard uh, elimination for hazardous material, and the pro is going to go on for 30 years, but every, so you can, can you set up a kind of a time schedule that it should be revisited and the mitigation measures should be re-evaluated every certain number of time, uh, years? So that no reason why not. So, th so that might be one of the solution because right. as the technology changes or as the standard itself change, like right now we can be willing to uh, stay with 10 parts per million for, st for certain chemical. Mm -hmm. Now the technology is such that we can live up to we can go down up to five parts per million. So we should have the option in the EIR when we approve that that if the technology changes, we will revisit every certain number of years because in the past what happens is that there is an EIR written in, uh, in one of the projects that, that I remember here and they came back to, uh, came to us and that was 10, 20 years ago that that was 10 years ago it was written and now this, it was specifically about the alternate energy solar mm. and at that time the EIR did not address that and now we're trying to do that, and uh, we were told that not, nothing can be done because that was the original EIR that approved that. So what I like to see is, is there is there any way in the EIR you can put that so that as the project, and this may be a very long-term project also, so in this particular project, EIR, we have to be very careful to have those kind of uh, steps so that as the, as the time elapses, we have the flexibility to go back and change it, rather than stuck that uh, you sh this is the this is it. Nothing can be done for right. It. Yeah, there's uh, there's not theoretically there's nothing to prevent you from doing that. But there's a couple of things to consider in doing that. Uh, one is if the mitigation measure is actually one that's going to be uh, undertaken and enforced by another agency let's say Department of Toxic yeah. Substances Control, you want to be sure that that mitigation measure is something that they will and can do. So you'd have to make sure that if you're setting up a time period, you know, a schedule for revisiting this mitigation, uh, objectives, those sorts of things, that those are things that they think they can do over, over that period of time. Because if it isn't something that they think they can do, it would be difficult for the city itself to enforce it. Yeah. It's, you know, so you want to make sure that you're working with these other agencies. So that's one thing to consider. Um, the other one is, I guess, what was, that, what was my other thought? Um, yeah, like I say, the, theoretically, there's no, no reason why you couldn't do it. But that, that's my main, my, would be my main concern, to make sure that you're, you know, yeah, talking like to with these other agencies. Yeah, I like to have the to have the flexibility to right. go, go now, back the other and, and make the applicant lift, uh, you know, follow the, the new standards, right. the new technology. Now, the other thing is that uh, CEQA, 
CEQA only applies to project when there's a discretionary action, when there's a discretionary permit, discretionary approval that's being requested by, by an applicant. And so if there's no discretionary action, there's no CEQA trigger. So five years down the line, you, you revisit, uh, unless, you, you know, unless there's some CEQA trigger, there may not be any mechanism to be able to revise the mitigation measure or anything like that in a public forum. Uh, and so that can be, that's a consideration that's, that's too. A, that's the one that we had a problem with because right. what they say is that the, in the CEQA, these were the minimum standards that uh -huh. were set and the things, conditions have not changed so we cannot revisit CEQA. Right. And, but I tried to get around that and see that even the conditions have not changed, technology has changed and can we, or the standards have changed in terms of how much, we, uh, what percent of solar energy we we should have. So right. their arguments was that the things have not, conditions have not changed, so you cannot touch the old CEQA findings. Yeah, because there's two and things. And that's, that's right. what they, I want to get around that in this particular project. Yeah, uh, so there's two things to consider. One is the discretionary actions, because that's what triggers CEQA. So in the future, what discretionary actions will there be? And you may want to tie uh, reviews, you know, future reviews to those discretionary actions. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, how do we make sure that that goes through a, a public process? Uh, because that's what CEQA requires, that there, that there be a subsequent EIR, a subsequent mitigated negative declaration, something like that, if you want to go about changing mitigation measures. There have been a couple of court cases over the years now where, um, in one case, an agency went back and revisited its mitigation measures. They were adopted, they'd adopted a specific plan for an industrial park uh, they were now coming back several years later to adopt a new or a revised specific plan for the industrial park. And that while we're at it, uh, we'll get rid of some of the mitigation measures relating to traffic and change some of the other mitigation measures. And they adopted a subsequent EIR to do, to do that. And the court said, yeah, we think that that's the way you're supposed to do it. If you want to change mitigation measures, you need to undertake a subsequent CEQA process so that the public is involved, they have an opportunity to weigh in on what they think the impact might be in the mitigation measures and all that sort of thing. There's but that's also only triggered even if you have a, a significant uh, change in the project, right? Well, yeah, it would be significant change in the project, significant change in the um, circumstances, or new information. So suppose there is no substantial new information change uh, in the project. And right. If there's none of that, then there's no that's, uh, no reason. Now, in this case, the the agency itself was motivated to go about changing the mitigation measure. So they took it upon themselves uh, because that they they saw that there were changes that had occurred with the the. Um, I guess the layout of the project, the sorts of industry that was going to go in, uh, that sort of thing. And so with those changes, they you know, well, the mitigation measures we have from 10 or 15 years ago, whenever it was, those really don't cover this project now that it's mm -hmm. been changed. And so they went back and made those changes. Uh, there's also a court case where, uh, I guess ba basically neighbors, neighbors brought suit against the city because the city wasn't implementing its mitigation measures. The city had adopted some unusual mitigation measures for a project that was going to tear down some historic bungalows and install condos in their place. Um, the mitigation measures are unusual because it was basically, uh, as you tear down each bungalow, the person who is evicted from that bungalow has to be offered the opportunity to move into one of the bungalows that hasn't been demolished. <laughs> so it was almost like musical chairs oh within this this old set of bungalows. You have to play musical chairs with the with the tenants. Mm. It's an odd mitigation measure. It was done for political purposes more than any real impact uh, because it was... Um, this conflict between the people who were living there and the developer who wanted to tear these things down. So it turned out that as the developer went along, uh, they weren't offering the residents that they were evicting the opportunity to move into one of the other bungalows. So the residents sued and they ended up winning. And the court said, city, if you want to change the mitigation measure, you can do that, but you have to do it through a subsequent CEQA process. So that offers an opportunity, and under that case offers perhaps an opportunity for the city to go in and, and make those changes. But again, the city has to have, generally has to have some discretionary hook uh, or it has to have some particular measure that it wants to change. We're going to change this measure and we have some reason to go about changing it. Okay, so it's kind of kind of complicated. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, like everything else. Nothing seems very simple with this.
uh, okay, mitigation monitoring. Can you so take a five minutes. Break? Oh, sure. You want to take a break? Okay. I think we have a question. Oh, do we have a question? Uh, we will. We will have the question after we come back from okay. the break.
No, it said until 10.30, this particular meeting. Not what I saw. Okay, we go back on the record. Uh, um, there's a member of the audience uh, had a okay. question. Yeah, can you can you also identify, myself? identify yourself? Hi, I'm Mary Gurukantz, and I'm a <coughs> resident of Brisbane. A long time. <laughs> no, not that long. You know, I've only probably lived here for about 16 years, so okay. I'm a newcomer. Right. Um, uh, oh, the um, oh one of the one of the things you had on the last slide it said <clears throat> that you need objective criteria for measuring success, and um, one of the things <clears throat> I'm concerned about is uh, the city's ability to actually enforce the uh, restrictions or the mitigation measures. Say the city says, well, you know, part of the mitigation you have to do is recreate some wetlands. Part of the mitigation for thus and such is recreating wetlands. And, uh, and so, you know, you're going down the road and it's six or eight years later and the wetlands haven't been recreated. And um, the city says, hey, you know, you need to do this. And the developer says, oh, yeah, well, we're, we're trying, you know, we'll get it done someday. Can, can, some, in these mitigation measures, can you build, can you build in um, things like, you, you know, this, the, the developer can't do this until this is done? Um, you can always build phasing in, that's the And, okay. Can you, know, Mary, can you? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that that is possible. As I was talking with John uh, during the break, uh, the other thing to keep in mind too is that CEQA isn't the be-all and end-all of, of the development approval process. Uh, should the city go about approving this project, a uh, portion of that approval would be a development agreement. And the development agreement can lay out those sorts of things. The development is going to be contingent upon these particular aspects of something being done. Uh, every five years we're going to re-examine this this particular thing. You know, the development agreement can lay all those things out. The development agreement can also have, um, if it's agreeable to the developer and they sign on the, the bottom line, uh, but it can go beyond the sort of mitigation that CEQA would allow because CEQA's mitigation is limited. Uh, you can't require something that somebody to do more than their fair share, for example, of, of traffic mitigation. They can mitigate their traffic, but they can't fix the road that's already full of traffic. Is that somebody else's traffic? But you can require them to go farther if, in a development agreement if they're agreeable to it. So uh, development agreement is another approach to uh, addressing some of these issues that doesn't necessarily have the same limitations that CEQA does. Okay. So that's something else to think about. Okay. And then uh, let's see. So program EIR, as I mentioned, it's kind of the foundation. Uh, not all of the mitigation measures are going to be the responsibility of the city on a big project like this with a variety of different aspects that are more or less outside the city's control. Uh, there are other regulatory agencies and some of the mitigation measures are going to be their responsibility, be their responsibility to monitor as well. Uh, let's see what else. So EIR considerations. So different parts. Project description, this is something we want to look at. Um, it's going to have the objectives, and these objectives are the things that are going to drive the alternatives, um, but we already have those described, so I guess that's it. Uh, environmental setting, this is actually settings. There's going to be an environmental setting for each one of those resource areas, the 15, 16, some are more than 10 and less than 20. Um, however many there are, there'll be an environmental setting for each one. Each environmental setting may be a little bit different. Some of them are actually going to be the site itself, some of them are going to be a larger area. Like air quality, for example, is going to be the Bay Area Air Basin, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, that will be one of the things that's described in the EIR. And then the environmental setting for that particular resource is going to be essentially the point from which we determine whether or not there's going to be significant. So that, ba that setting is the baseline for the study. And whatever impact the project has above that baseline, uh, that's the project's impact. Excuse me, I have a mm -hmm. question. Sure. Um, Bay Area Air Quality Management District relative to studying air quality in Brisbane thus far has been 
to my knowledge, an air quality monitor on Potrero Hill and another one even further away to determine air quality in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So if that stays, if those two monitors stay in place, how does that help us figure out the air quality for this project? Yeah, the air quality for a project like this is typically modeled. It's not really determined by what the, uh, you know, what those stations have to say, what those two uh, air quality monitoring stations have to say. Those would be, those would be provided as some of the baseline information, in other words, the setting, right. give an idea of what things are like here. But the uh, potential air quality emissions from the site will be, will be put into the model. Uh, projections for what air quality will be in the future will be put into the model. All of those things will come together and the determination as to what emissions will come out of the project are actually going to be the result of, of modeling. Okay. It's done. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so those, those monitoring stations, um, they're part of it, but they're just kind of giving a general idea of what's going on here. But they're not going to be determinative of, of what the impacts would be. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's see what else. So this idea of environmental setting is baseline. Um, this baseline can be flexible. So in some cases, baseline are going to might be what's out there right now. In other cases, baseline might be a bit more flexible. Uh, for example, if there are flowering plants on the site, uh, the baseline is not going to be during the winter. The baseline is going to be at some point in time when you can actually go out and determine whether or not the flowering plants are there, because uh, you can see them in the spring but not in the winter. Um, so there may be some situations where uh, baseline will be, um, you know, would be averaged over a period of time, uh, that sort of thing. One thing that baseline can't be is what's called hypothetical future conditions. So you, you can't say, for example, that, um, well, you know, the, the, the city's general plan shows that this is going to be developed to this particular level of, of uh, development. Uh, and so that's what we're going to use as the baseline. That would not apply. It would be what's out there right now. It's more or less existing conditions or conditions that, uh, as I say, are variable over time that we're taking an average of um, or, uh, you know, some variation in conditions that are seasonal. Okay? I have a question. So are you saying, I, I just don't quite understand, if it is projected that over the next hundred years the sea level rise in this area is going to be X number of feet. That shouldn't be part of the hypothetical future condition? That's not the baseline. The baseline is what are we measuring the project against for its, for its initial impact. That would be part of what's called a cumulative impact analysis. Because the, cum the baseline is looking at what's out there right now. Uh -huh. Cumulative impact is looking, well, what are the uh, impacts that are a result of past, present, and reasonably foreseeable activities. Uh -huh. So um, sea level rise is kind of a cumulative impact. It's a future, a future impact. So it's something that, the, that potentially would have to be looked at, but not as a baseline. Okay, baseline is what do we measure the project against? What do we measure the project's impact against? Cumulative impact is um, what sort of future things are going to be out there that the project may contribute to or the project may be affected by. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. we're looking at direct impacts and then these sort of future impacts in two different ways. Uh, now it says NOP release. I, I simply don't know. Oh, that's a notice of preparation release. Oh. Yeah, so at the time the notice of preparation came out, that's what CEQA says. That can be the, the point in time uh, that we determine our baseline. But as I say, that wouldn't necessarily be a single, a single day in time. It may actually be a flexible date depending on the particular resource. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an example of when a reliable projection was used f with a baseline? Yeah, for example, um, you know, it's relatively reliable to uh, project traffic conditions out maybe five, ten years. Okay. And so what has happened, what happened in one uh, court case was that uh, a city had a, um, a new medical center that was going in. Uh, and so what they did was, rather than using today's traffic, uh, they said, well, we'll use as a baseline what we uh, expect traffic to be in five years when the medical center actually opens. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, what sort of capital improvements, what sort of road improvements are we uh, actually have the money to do 
between now and five years from now, uh, what sort of projects do we expect that have already been approved will be built between now and five years from now? Uh, what other sort of activity will be occurring on these roads within five years? And they kind of squished all that together and said, we're going to make that our baseline. So mm -hmm. more traffic from other sources, uh, road improvements that will kind of uh, reduce traffic impacts that the city's already already going to do and will be doing in the next five years. We're going to use that as our baseline. So it's it's not actually today. It says normally existing conditions. Well, that isn't existing conditions. But in that case, the court said it's okay because it's it's a reliable projection of what might occur. Because it's reliable because it's a relatively short period of time. Uh, it's reliable because you've identified the capital improvements that are in the capital improvement program for the city that will affect the streets that are affected by this project. Uh, and it's also reliable because you've identified all the various sorts of projects that you've approved and that have been approved in the area that are going to be putting traffic onto this street. And so putting all that together, that seems like that's a, that's a reasonable projection. Okay. Okay, so that would be an example of a, of a court case where a court determined that that was reasonable. And who was making those determinations? Uh, the city. The city was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So they, and that was with whatever party they used, contracted to help right. them? Or mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it was part of their EIR, so their traffic consultant had decided that uh, they actually used two baselines. They used mm -hmm. one baseline that was existing conditions and compared that to the project, and then they used this other baseline, which they called background conditions, and compared that to the project as well. So, so they kind of had two okay. different sets of baselines that they used for traffic, just so out of uh, just out of caution. So the so I guess part of that, which makes sense, is that the reliability is also based on the um, the uh, <coughs> traffic consultants or the approval or their right. reliability too. Right. 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 It's yeah that they've that they've uh, they've plugged these things into a standard sort of model. Yeah. You know, this is a uh, accepted model that's used by traffic consultants, that sort of thing. It wasn't that um, they kind of flipped coins and made the decision that way. Right. Uh, yes or no, we'll flip a coin. Okay, it's yes this time. Yes or no, we'll flip a coin. Oh, no, it's no that time. They didn't do that sort of thing. Well, the problem in this environment is we don't have the development. The, the money has been taken out from the cities, and even though we have plans for five years, we already have all the agreements, but the governor has taken all the money, so we cannot rely on the, the reliability is not there anymore for, mm -hmm. the, for those assumptions. So I think, in my opinion, it's better to have what's existing now and go from there rather than five years we have. Planned. Well, what has also been done is the use of um, the use of regional projections. There's also a case down in Southern California where um, a uh, what would you call it a a transportation agency they were, they were proposing to put in a new uh, uh, light rail line in uh, in the Los Angeles area and so the, one of the issues that popped up was traffic impacts and so they went to the Southern, Southern California Association of Government SCAG uh, to find out what SCAG's traffic projections were for the next 30 years uh, and in that case the court said that's reasonable to use a 30-year projection from right. SCAG. It's not something I recommend. Right. That, that's what I was getting at. I said that it's really, it, a lot of it's based on the credibility of right. what sub consultant you're using to make these. Yeah, or the agency that you've derived the information from. Yeah. In this case, the court seemed to have a great deal of uh, c confidence in that's the information. Right. The traffic projections and economic and population projections that SCAG had produced. Yeah. More confidence than I would have, I think. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so that they call it a reasonable projection of future conditions. Yeah. But to me, it, it, uh, the way I would look at it, if, if I, what, what I do when I'm uh, advising clients is put it, tie it back to something that's real. You know, like in the case of this mm -hmm. other this other agency where they had a capital improvements project, they had money. These are the sorts of things they were going to put in. Uh, if you had a situation where you didn't have money. You wouldn't count those. Yeah. You wouldn't count those improvements. But how are you going to figure out that the governor is going to take redevelopment money from you? Right. Yeah. So it's better well, to, it's it's just better to it's have a, the existing. Yeah, it's a reasonable, condition. reasonable projection. Yeah. 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 And you can use existing if you want to. Either one. Yeah. 
so level of detail, typically program EIR has less level of detail than uh, an EIR for a small project, uh, but it can vary depending on how much is known about various parts of the project. Uh, and the analysis will tend to match the level of detail that we have about the various parts of the project. So things that are known well will tend to be analyzed in more detail than things that are less well known. Things that are occurring in the short term tend to be more um, completely analyzed than things that are occurring in the far long term because we simply know more about them. It's better to do more analysis for something that we don't know, right? It helps, <laughs> right. Depends on the Rather than we know. Right. <laughs> sense yeah. of having a uh, detailed analysis of something that's... Yeah, what I mean, though, is that uh, if, it's, if we don't have the detail in the project, uh, sometimes a, a project will just have a blob. And it's a green blob, and that's going to be a park. Hmm. And have a yellow blob, and that's going to be the commercial area. But we don't really know where the streets are going to be. Uh, we don't know what kind of playground equipment we're going to have, whether we're going to have lighted soccer fields, uh, or whether it's going to be a park that is just trees. You know, if you don't know those details, then your EIR is not going to reflect that sort of detail because you simply don't know it. Okay, so, but if you do know the details, then you have to reflect that in the nice. EIR. Okay. okay, then we have the idea of cumulative impacts. Uh, these are impacts from the collective contributions of lots and lots of projects, uh, either region-wide or in the case of greenhouse gases, climate change, even uh, worldwide. Uh, the, Individual contributions by themselves are not necessarily significant, but taken together they would be. Mm -hmm. So what SQL wants the EIR to do is to look to see whether or not there are any of these cumulative impacts that the project would contribute to. Typical ones are traffic, uh, air quality, uh, climate change, um, sometimes noise, uh, light and glare. Uh, those are typical things that any sort of project is going to be contributing to that might already be a, a significant effect. So in this particular case, we will be looking at what San Francisco is going to do next to this particular parcel and also the Geneva extension. So right. traffic analysis, we had to Exactly. So the cumulative analysis is going to look at all of, that, all of that reasonably foreseeable future activity that's occurring too. So that's one way that the environmental impact report picks up not only the things that are changing from existing baseline, but how the project might be contributing to these other activities that are occurring as part of this larger world that it's in. Mm -hmm. And what's so the maximum timeline is used? In a there's no particular it, it, maximum timeline. 20 right. years projection? Or what? It just depends on what sort of information is available. So in some cases, maybe they're using... Um, Maybe they're using the projections for population that are available from ABAG, and those are 2035 20, projections. Well, you'd use 2035 projections. So whatever the reasonable information that's available out there, that's what you would use. In some cases, it may be a smaller period of time. There's kind of two ways of looking at cumulative impacts. One is through a list approach, where you try and list all of the projects that are, that are reasonably foreseeable to be coming down the road within the area. Uh, the other one is the plan or the projections approach, where you apply some plan or some set of projections to identify what this cumulative context is. The list approach tends to be shorter term because you don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now, but you probably have a list of those projects that have been proposed over the next couple of, the, for consideration over the next couple of years. So the length of time that you're going out can vary depending on the particular issue, depending on the approach that you take in analyzing the issue. There's no particular period of time. It isn't 15 years or 20 years or 25 years. So both, both the approaches are acceptable? Either approach is acceptable, right. And yeah. even some, in some cases I've seen uh, you know, EIRs where they've used kind of a hybrid of the two approaches. Mm. They've used air quality projections, for example, but they know that there are going to be other projects that are, are being proposed that aren't, um, aren't reflected in the Air District's numbers. And so they may include those in their model and use projections from the, the Air District plus these additional projects that they know are out, potentially going to be out there uh, contributing emissions. So you can see hybrids too. I see. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, as I mentioned, it doesn't specify any sort of analytical method, uh, professional practice, things that other agencies recommend, uh, there are methods that are indicated by other laws, um, all that sort of stuff. And then air quality. All, all of that stuff will begin to rely on the city's consultant to... For the most part, right, mm -hmm. yeah. 
And air quality, here are some of the things. The air, the air quality management district has methodologies for screening for uh, toxic air contaminants, basically diesel, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and so you, those methodologies would be applied to determine whether or not the project appeared to cross a threshold. And if it does cross a threshold, uh, then a, a uh, hazard study would have to be done. Uh, and then there's the, what's called the Cal-E mod uh, that's now the accepted um, model to be used for traffic uh, and land use air quality emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also a couple of other models that my air quality guy told me about, off-road and MFAC. Uh, those are used for construction mm -hmm. impacts. Uh, both of those relate to um, the use of heavy equipment, uh, graders, um, big trucks, uh, that kind of stuff. And so you plug in the typical sorts of construction equipment and the off-road and the MFAC models uh, will give you what the various sorts of air emissions that would typically be produced by those trucks. So you put in the amount of time for construction, the sorts of construction machines, and off-road or MFAC will give you an idea of what the emissions are going to be. And then there's something called CalLine 4, which is used if there is a potential for carbon monoxide hotspots. Um, that's more or less determined in consultation with the air district, usually. Um, and it relates back to traffic. Areas where there would be traffic congestion are typically areas that would potentially have uh, carbon monoxide hotspots. Mm -hmm. And if those pop up as part of your initial analysis, then they would run what's called the CalLine 4 model to determine what the extent of uh, that, those hotspots might be. And then for traffic, uh, there's something called the FHWA Federal Highways Administration Traffic Noise Model 2.5. Uh, that's more or less the accepted standard, although others, other models can be used. Uh, there's also FHWA models that are available for construction noise, and so those are typical. Uh, and then traffic, there's traffic demand model. There's a variety of different ones. The synchro that I mentioned uh, is commonly used. Uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission has this Baycast 90 uh, that's also a traffic demand model. So depending on the, the characteristics of the project, the sorts of traffic that are being uh, projected as coming out of the project, uh, that depend that you know that makes a difference on the sort of model that the um, uh, traffic consultants will decide to use. So these are just some typical methods that they go about using. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, for the most part, I when I'm reviewing one of these things, I tend to trust the traffic engineers. Uh, I trust tend to trust the air quality folks. Uh, and so what I'm generally looking for are areas that it appears that they may not have, perhaps for one reason or another, they didn't cover an aspect of it or something like that. So that's generally what I look for, is uh, holes in the uh, analyses rather than whether or not I believe the analyses are accurate, because I, I really couldn't tell. I don't in have the a traffic model. model, do they, do they go about uh, analyzing the what type of signal signaling device can will be recommended for the intersection right. and all of that. Mm -hmm. They certainly would, yeah. The level of service is also... Right, so they look at level of service, uh, they look at uh, volume capacity ratio typically, um, they will be identifying um, the size of roads, uh, turn turn lanes, the necessity for turn lanes, right lane, left lane, turn lanes, uh, installation of signals, uh, whether or not roundabouts. In some cases, some of the newer, um, yeah. you know, some some people are looking at roundabouts instead of uh, stop signs. You know, all of those things will be and bicycles arrived. And, uh, and the you know uh, the ability to my understanding is the ability to model in bicycles is, is relatively limited. It depends on you know what model they're using. They have to tweak their existing models to to put in a bicycle component. What about the the uh, you know tr uh, trains or light rail systems and all that? Right. Yeah. The the um, traffic engineers will generally um, to have some consideration for those, so that if you are served by by light rail and the development is within a particular distance from a light rail station, uh, it would essentially get a discount on on the amount of traffic okay. that is. So producing. in this particular case, we do have the intermodal. Right. There would be the potential for the for the station right there. And also. Yeah. So it may be that when you look at the traffic analysis that. Uh, as you're reading through the traffic section, that they'll talk about that. They'll say, you know, we, we gave them a discount because there's, this portion of the project is going to be within walking distance of that. And so uh, we took that into account in what we think the, the traffic numbers are going to be. They also take into account the, the freeway off-ramps and on-ramps and all that? Right. 
yeah, all of that, all of that goes in, uh, gets plugged into the model. For air quality, um, the things that they'll be looking at is the mix of vehicles. Uh, is it a project that would result in a lot of uh, truck traffic? If so, then we'll we'll add trucks to the to the model. Um, they also, for air quality, they'll also uh, uh, take into account the improvement in uh, gas mileage over time, uh, as well as uh, reduction in emissions over time. Because it's assumed by these models that, uh, by this uh, MFAC model, or I should say the Cal E mod model, uh, it's assumed by that model that both of those things are going to get better over time, that emissions are going to be reduced, and then also that uh, gas mileage is going to be improved. So the models are pretty sophisticated. And like I said, there's some things that they don't necessarily do very well. Uh, it's difficult for them to take into account people who are pedestrians or who are bicyclists. So the traffic model may not reflect the number of people who are bicycling to work or walking to work, that sort of thing. Um, they generally don't really, yeah, they don't, they haven't really thought about that. Also, I guess they probably uh, If there was a carpooling requirement, they could take carpooling into account too. Mm. But the traffic model by itself wouldn't, offhand, wouldn't necessarily take carpooling into account. Because uh, you have to make assumptions about how many people are going to carpool. And uh, I don't know. It depends on the traffic engineer, but they may not make assumptions um, you know, right off the bat. So you would really run it to see what would happen if you were to require it, and they'd give you, you know, we could tell whether or not it mitigated, mm. but uh, they may not do it right off the bat. So your advice in this particular case is we should rely more on the traffic engineers. That's my hard. recommendation, right? Okay. I tend to I tend to rely on my uh, sub consultants and you know people on my staff. Uh, who do this work because they know a lot more about it than I do. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and then uh, technical data. Um, the the ER is supposed to be accessible to the average resident. So what CEQA guidelines say is that um, an EIR can summarize technical information and should probably can put the technical information itself in a, an appendix. So if anybody wants to see it, they can. If they want to wade through the details, they can. Uh, but the EIR doesn't necessarily have to have all of that technical data in its various chapters. And then planning commission. So the thing to think about is that, uh, as I mentioned before, this, this uh, public meeting that you're going to be having, CEQA doesn't mandate a public hearing on a, on a draft EIR. It doesn't require that there be any hearing at all. And so this meeting that, that the planning commission is going to have to take comments is really kind of an extra, uh, offering people the opportunity to come in and actually talk to the Planning Commission and verbally give you their comments. Um, they can submit their written comments. Uh, as you mentioned before, this is the city's EIR, so you have to be sure to use discretion in what you say during the hearings. Mm -hmm. um, for this meeting, it's essentially listening to what people have to say. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, answering any of, their, any of their questions or responding to any of their comments. That's going to be done formally in the, in the final EIR. And if they ask why, that's the process. CEQA sets up the process, and that's the process. Is that you get written re responses back as part of the final EIR. Uh, let's see, so what else goes? There's the city council, so there's going to be these open houses. Um, there'll be formal public hearings, of course. And people can, at the, f at the public hearing on the project, again, people have the opportunity to talk about CEQA and the adequacy of the EIR, um, that sort of thing. And then uh, this formal review period on the draft, 120 days, that isn't actually a strict cutoff. People can continue to comment after the 120 days because when the final EIR, final EIR is done, that's when the Planning Commission is going to hold its deliberations, and that's when the City Council is going to hold its deliberations. People can still comment during those deliberations. So even though the, the review period ended previously and people had the opportunity for 120 days to turn in their written or submit their verbal comments at the meeting, that doesn't mm. restrict them from coming in again and offering more comments. So in, ca in case uh, they come up with their totally new comments that were not discussed at the Planning Commission meeting, they just go directly to the, to the City Council meeting. Right. Then in, in that particular case, uh, what will be the responsibility of the Planning Commission because they made a recommendation based on that they didn't have the opportunity to review that, right. those comments. So yeah, and that that's, be that's something that's kind of outside of CEQA. CEQA doesn't address that. 
I but see. under the government code, uh, government code basically requires that if, if the city council wants to make uh, substantial changes to the recommendation of, this, of the planning commission, they're supposed to send it back to the commission. But the question is, are the changes substantial? So it's up to the city council to decide whether or not uh, they feel that they're making changes that are substantial enough to be sent back to the commission for further consideration. But that's outside of CEQA. I see. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. So final EIR is going to be probably a two-parter. Uh, there will be this final EIR that has the comments, the written responses by the city, uh, a list of the commenters, and then any changes that are being made to the draft. And then the second part would be the draft EIR itself. Uh, and so a commission is going to look at both of those, which together form this, this final EIR, um, and deliberate on them before making this decision. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea of late hits, quote unquote, that's the idea of someone coming in and presenting a new comment to you that you've not seen before. Um, this happens quite commonly on large controversial projects. Um, I worked on a project for a county uh, a couple of years ago. The project, we were actually, I think, the fourth or fifth, um, we had worked on the fourth or fifth version of the EIR that had been done. The project itself had been going on for over 10 years. Uh, the same people had been coming in for 10 years and commenting on these various versions of, of the EIR. Mm. The Planning Commission had held several hearings on it. Every Planning Commission hearing, the people had come in with a 40-page letter um, purporting to have additional comments that they hadn't made before. Uh, the Board of Supervisors held hearings on it. Uh, I went to the last of those hearings, and what do you know, same people, 40, another 40 pages worth of comments that they're purporting were new information or new comments that they hadn't given before. So what we did, as I mentioned before, what we did in that case was that on the advice of the um, uh, council, county council, we took a short break, quickly read through all the comments, 40 pages worth of comments, determined that there was actually nothing new. They were all just rehashes of their old comments. I mean, how could you come up with new ones after 10 years, yeah. right? Um, but they were all just rehashes, advised city staff, look, or I should say county staff, looks as though these are the same as before. Uh, Board of Supervisors came back and then continued their deliberations. But that, that set of comments, if they had a new set, new comment, that would have been something new for the Board of Supervisors to consider. So even though all this time had passed, CEQA allows people to keep coming back with more and more comments if they want. So on a large controversial project, you have to keep that in mind, that uh, even though people have been afforded uh, an opportunity to, to present their comments, they may still have you know, an extra comment here that they've never shown you before. Yeah. So. Don't and be, one don't one be more question I have regarding the, based on the court cases that you had, uh, the Planning Commission comes up with a set of recommendations based on their review of the whole EIR. Now, if the City Council decided not to, not to accept their recommendations, would they, at a, at a little point when they, it goes to the litigation before the judge, are they going to weigh as to, uh, or the city council has to give the reasons why they didn't accept the planning commission's recommendations? Yeah, that's outside of my area of expertise. I don't know, but it, you know, it part of it depends on what the opponents argue, and it could be that that's one of the things the opponents are going to argue that uh, you know, city council didn't listen to the to the planning commission, and they should have, and so on and so forth. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how something like that would turn out, but I would think that. Um, you know, the opponents of the city would bring that up if there was a difference, clear difference between the Planning Commission and the City Council. Mm -hmm. It came up in the one case in Sacramento that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't surprise me if that would be an argument. Whether they win depends on the facts. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, of course, you're going to look at the project. Um, yeah. Let's see what else. Yeah, you can approve. You can recommend approval, obviously, modifications, denial. Uh, you could recommend adoption of one of the project alternatives. Those are your basic, basic potential recommendations. Can, can the commission come up with a, a, the alternate recommendation or, or alternate suggestion? I wouldn't recommend that's it. That's based not, not on the EIR itself? Yeah, you could. But I wouldn't recommend it yes. because what happens then is that arguably the, the, that recommendation needs to be analyzed. Mm -hmm. And if it needs to be analyzed and it wasn't in the EIR, then the EIR has to be revised and then recirculated. So uh, 
I wouldn't advise coming up with a late, you know, 11th hour alternative. So here we have the uh, bicycle sharing program in the city of Milan, Italy. Uh, for a nominal fee, something like, I don't know, 5 euros or 15 euros, you can sign up for a year's worth of bicycle sharing. Uh, and you simply grab a bicycle off the, well, I should say, you simply walk up to the little kiosk, punch in your, your PIN number, uh, decide which bicycle you want. I want 2270. Uh, push a button. The lock opens up. You can ride off on that bicycle. It's the half, first half hour is free. Uh, and then after that, it's like one euro per half hour or something. People ride those bloody things all over town. It's amazing. <laughs> it was great. And this gentleman who's got that bike there, he's actually one of the bike wranglers. Uh, he's returning a bike to the rack. Uh, the really popular bicycle stations run out of bikes by the late afternoon. Mm. And so the city has this guy who goes around in this truck full of bikes uh, who replenishes yeah. the bikes. <laughs> that's interesting. Wow. Well, so it's pretty wild. It's like a zip car, right? Similar to... It's like that, yeah. It's like a zip car, except it's a bike. It's like a zip bike. <laughs> exactly. <Pink>. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good evening. They also have that in Barcelona. They do. Oh, Other really parts of Spain. Going. Yeah. Very interesting. So I'm just going to talk to you for a few minutes about running an effective meeting, um, since you're going to be doing some of that. <laughs> um, these are just some of the, the key things. No surprises. You want to tell people what to expect and what to follow, and then follow through with it. So tell them what you're going to do, do it, and then if there's any things afterwards that you told them that you would do as far as, far as follow up, do that. You want to choose a meeting format to meet your goals, whether you're having a hearing or an informational workshop or an open house. And I'll be talking more in more detail focus on uh, the type of hearings that you'll be doing to receive public comments. Pre-meeting preparation is key, probably the most important thing. My mom used to always tell us prior planning pays, <laughs> and I was thinking of that as I was putting this together, because that's really the key thing, to have the materials that you need, to have given people adequate notice, um, know how you're going to construct the meeting, what you're going to say, who's going to say say it and all of that. Follow through. When you've decided you're going to have a public hearing where you're going to take public comments, don't let it turn into an informational hearing. If it's an informational session where you want to talk to people and get their input, you don't want it to turn into a, a public hearing where you're only taking formal comments. And last is the post-meeting follow-up. When you, you want to tell people what the next steps are going to be and then follow through and do what you have told them you're going to do. So when you're trying to figure out what your meeting is going to be, why are you having the meeting? Is it to provide information or update the community or, for instance, receive public comments? What do you hope to accomplish? Do you want people to have a better understanding of the project? Do you want to have a better understanding of how people feel about the project? Or again, is this what, something that you need to do in order to comply with um, the legalities related to your project? And then what can people expect at the meeting and afterwards? What kind of presentation are you going to offer? What are the comment opportunities in uh, the case of a formal public hearing? So as I said, we'll, I'm going to focus more on the public hearing aspect of this rather than the other types of uh, meetings that you might want to be having. So when you're planning for your public hearing, and a lot of this is um, staff will be doing it rather than you people, but these are decisions that have to be made collectively. Uh, the hearing notice, you want to have multiple delivery methods so that you ensure that as many people hear about it as possible, so you, the website, newspapers, newsletters, um, postings around town, whatever types of um, venues you have available to you, you want to use those. And in that hearing notice, you want to tell people what to expect, uh, what the, the meeting is for, how it will be conducted, how they can learn more about it, how they can comment, what the deadlines are, as much um, of that pertinent information as possible. 
As you're planning the meeting, you'll be, want to be thinking about who will be conducting the hearing. Some uh, uh, jurisdictions actually have an outside um, person conduct a hearing. They, um, some people rely on the chairperson of your planning commission or the mayor of your city council. But in particular large or controversial projects, sometimes you go outside the um, a retired elected official, um, the director of a nonprofit organization or something along those lines. Uh, you want to establish ground rules for how the meeting will be conducted, um, time limits, how people will queue up for comments. Uh, if those of you who were at our first uh, training workshop for the general public might recall that we had a list of ground rules, which sound very formal, but it's basically so that people know what to expect and what to do and uh, how to behave that you want to give people, everybody time to, to comment, you want to take questions at a certain time, you, uh, things along those lines. Um, generally, um, people are given a time limit to make their public comments, um, usually two to three minutes. I've actually never been to a hearing where there was not a time limit on um, public comments. And I've also participated in hearings on the other side as the person commenting where, because the, um, the board of supervisors was running out of time, and so they changed the time limit from three minutes to one minute. Mm. So, um, and that's not something I recommend. It doesn't uh, put people in a very good frame of mind. But that is an arbitrary decision about how much time you give people. And in this case, of course, as I said earlier, you're going to want to emphasize the many different ways that people can comment. They can make oral comments. They can make formal written comments. They can send an email. So, um, and that's limits on an oral comment help people stay focused. They provide time for everybody else who wants to comment. You could have dozens of people here at your hearings, and nobody wants to sit here until midnight or one o'clock in the morning, especially the people in the audience. So keeping people focused on a time limit, it allows time for everybody to speak, and it also it helps them get the information that you really need, which is in the written comments. Terry has talked earlier about how people need to cite um, the information that they're referring to for a, a website, for instance. And we heard from the chairperson reading the city website earlier. That can be tough if you're making a verbal comment and to get all of those details down or where they got the report or what their data is. And so it's really beneficial to everybody if those very detailed comments are uh, submitted in writing rather than somebody get up and try to read all of that. And as you would want to be reminding people, all comments are weighted equally. So it doesn't matter if someone is standing in front of you in person giving their comment or they've submitted it in writing or on the website. They all are evaluated and weighted equally. Terry alluded to the fact that uh, the hearing panel does not answer questions or respond to comments. You're here to receive the comments. You're not here with the expertise or the um, to answer those comments. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes because I know that's really difficult to do. Uh, another decision is uh, how the oral comments will be recorded. Sometimes um, in addition to a taped recording, there's a court reporter uh, present, which can make it a little simpler if you don't hear something or um, that there is a court reporter there that can read back, although um, having things recorded is pretty common as well, or just relying on having things recorded is very common. Um, you want to know what your next steps are going to be. For example, what the end of the comment period is, when you expect the final EIR to come out, what happens to people's comments? How are they responded to? As Terry said, they would be uh, the response to comments is part of the final EIR, and you will want to be talking to people about that. And the last um, thing is for the planning is to have all the support materials, sign-in sheets, evaluation forms if you decide to do that. You might want to have informational boards like uh, a board with the ground rules, mm -hmm. um, comment cards. A lot of times we use um, 
something like this, where it's a form that people can be handed uh, to just fill it out. They can hand it to you then, or they can take it home and send it in. Um, and when I missed a step, you will need to decide, too, about people checking in and um, queuing up for comments. When you have a big audience making public comments, they can be very conscious of where they are in the queue to get up and make their comments. They know when they came in, when they signed in. And so we often have them fill out uh, a card with their name and contact information on it, which is also good for the public record as well. And perhaps you number that card. And so they turn that in, and then the hearing officer is able to call people up in that numerical order. Um, some places give people just a, a ticket, almost like a, a raffle ticket kind of thing, where it's got a number on it. And that's the um, order that they're called in. But it is important. Um, for people to respect people's time and, and uh, to have some sort of uh, streamlined method to get them to come up when it's their turn. I have a question regarding sure. the written comments of when somebody handed it over. In order to put it in the record, as the chairperson is going to say that we received these written comments, don't have to read it. Not necessary, right? No, you do not have to read it. You just... Um, but we have to acknowledge that, right? Not necessarily, no. I mean, they could be leaving their comments on the sign-in table okay. out at the front, um, for instance. You don't have to say, okay, I now have a written comment from so-and-so. It's just, it's a convenience thing that they, many people like to make an oral comment, and then they have in their hand a far more detailed written comment that they will then hand to you at the same time. Yeah. The spoken comment, the oral comment, it's as much for their community as it is for the planning commission or the city council. People like to be heard and they're, let their neighbors know where they stand. And so standing up the, here. The reason I ask is sometimes people hand the written comment and the letter on set says that I hand it over to the staff and it's not there. So if it's not part of the record where the, uh, the court reporter is recording, what comments were received in the names of the person, then it's, it's in the record. But if it's just put in uh, without any kind of you know acknowledgement, then somebody can say later on that, oh, I submitted this and there's no record of that. And you might decide then that you want to um Say the you know say the name out loud that you got those letters, but it's the potential is that you are going to have a lot of them turned in, and that doesn't really. Um, I think that's a different type of problem because people can mail them in, and you don't have any way of knowing. No, they that. mail them so, in, then at least they have the, you know the certification or something from the if, Yes, that's true. If because somebody it has really happened cares, they'll get it certified. People say I submitted and I I. I what happened to my comment? And, and that might be a decision that you want to make, that you are going to um, make some sort of effort to formally enter those written comments mm -hmm. into your public record. Yeah. Right. Um, and that, that, as I say, that would be your, uh, that would be your de a decision to make sure that you've really gone up to the greatest efforts you can to make sure that everybody's acknowledged. Nothing gets lost. Is it is it possible to have a, <clears throat> a limit on the written comments? Or uh, words? Know, or? I have not seen that. I and I have seen um, some pretty detailed, <laughs> pretty extensive written comments. And that is sort of the offset to the time limits on the, the oral comments that you can submit written comments of any length. You can also submit comments as many times as you want. Um, if you review um, the response to comments, sometimes you, you review a document and you think, oh my gosh, they've got 50 comments. And then you look down the list of people who actually commented, and it could be the same 10 or 15 people, but mm -hmm. they did. They came to formal public hearings and made a comment. They submitted something in writing it there, and then they later sent something else in. So um, I, I am not aware of any limits on that. OK, so um, conducting the public hearing. We, you would want to introduce your panel and t 
tell people what's going to happen at the meeting, review the procedures and the ground rules, emphasize that the panel will not respond to comments or questions, explain what happens after the comments are received, the final EIR process and the deadline, reminding people that uh, all comments have the same weight, whether they're oral and written, and how they can submit those written comments if they want to. Um, as I mentioned, we like to use some kind of card so uh, you know who and when people are going to be commenting, and so you would ask people to do those. And then you would start calling people forward. Usually if there's a lot of people, you want to queue them up two or three at a time, so you're calling out you know, three or four names at a time to keep make people moving. Mm -hmm. If you have decided to <clears throat> use the time limits, um, and again, this can be kind of difficult, but you just are treating everybody the same and um, giving them, a say, a 30-second warning, and then when you get to the end of their time period, invite them to wrap up their comments. You're not going to cut somebody off in the middle of a sentence, but you also out of respect for everybody, will want to uh, advise them to finish their thought or sentence so that you can move on to the next person. Have you had a third party be the timer, timekeeper? Yes, yes, that's a um, very good point. I think, actually, your podium is set up with timing. Um, oh, yeah, right. I thought I noticed that the first meeting I came to here. Yes, you would usually, though, have somebody as a timekeeper. It's very hard for the panel, actually, to be um, the timekeeper. And I've seen often that um, the panelists get caught up in listening mm -hmm. to the comments, and they forget that... Sure. Oh, it's it's time to stop. That's why there are three lights over there, and the bottom one is still green. So is you it, run that. So yes. You. <laughs> you you run that from over there. I I can at any time you ask. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. And and that um, leads me to something else because when I said you can lose track of time, it is very important that the panel always look engaged and interested in the comments. You don't want to. Look at your watch, look at your phone, look like you're checking your email. Um, taking notes is fine, but you really want to um, stay engaged. I've unfortunately been in some really long, long hearings and seen um, the panel panelists doze off. And, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> while it might be understandable, it, it doesn't send the message that you want to send, of course. And It's, it's, it's very it's, common with the state senators and all those. Yep, yep, <laughs> it, it's bad, so, um, but you, I know that you would want to, you want to recognize the people's effort, they came out, they're here, and uh, so, and that's, you'll be so engaged in the comments, that's the reason for having a, a separate timekeeper mm -hmm. to help you with that. Um, okay, so I just wanted to touch on a couple of things about, um, challenging people. That's the one in this case is the can person... We, can we change that to passionate people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, even better. You know, I... I um, this one, Mary, is really going to help us. I'm actually going to put that down because, you know, we call it in the facilitation world, we call it difficult people, and I didn't want to say that. But um, So I thought challenging was a good compromise, but passionate's even better. <laughs> So the person who keeps talking after their time is called. Um, you need to remind him or her that there's others that need to comment and suggest that they submit the written comment. Um, hand them a form even, or some you know a staff person can hand them a, a form and remind them that all comments carry equal weight, written as well as oral. Um, one of the things that we, um, for one of your comments, we're working on is sort of a commenter's tip sheet, how to really make good, effective comments. And to make a really good, an effective comment is most likely a written comment because of the organization and the detail. As Terry said, you can read through these, you know, somebody can stand up here and say something and, okay, but what are you really saying and what's really your point? It's hard in uh, even... I think it's harder without a time limit to make an effective comment unless you have written yourself a little speech. You can stand up here 
and do another thing and oh did I say instead of really making a good strong comment mm -hmm. so um, all of those yeah. things we would hope would help people focus their comments and, and say what they need to say the other thing that I said and um, I think one of uh, your chairperson alluded to this earlier about not responding to people uh, again I have been in hearings where a very passionate person comes up and they want answers and that's not the role of the hearing and it can be very hard to, to sit here and not say anything but your role is to listen and not respond and so again you would want to reiterate what you're here for offer opportunities to discuss their question or, or uh, issue at another time and then you just sit there and let the time run out and hopefully and when the time runs out, you invite them to sit down, which you're back to the top um, challenging person there. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, God. Um, and then follow up, next steps. Um, what final dates to submit comments? Um, and I know this is reiterative, but that's kind of what you need to be doing is reminding people of what's going to happen. When, what they need to do to get their comments in, what happens to their comments, the final EIR will address them when you uh, expect that to be coming out, um, what the website is, and the schedule for the final EIR, and, uh, and other hearing opportunities or comment opportunities that could come up. So. Have you used, and don't we have a graphic of what happens with the comments <coughs> that we could use? Or? Yeah, we can certainly put together some materials that have things like the three ways of commenting, you know, right. on, online or by letter or what have you. And then we could put, um, you know, sort of standard letters, whatever. We can provide that kind of information as part of a... Additional material. Yeah, yeah. So it's even the back of the room kind of thing where people right. pick up as part of a packet or an agenda. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, John had talked about having... Um, informational workshops prior to mm -hmm. the public comments depending on the city council's uh, approval. Yeah, if I could, just maybe two minutes real quickly in terms of the planning commissions. And this kind of gets to what Karen was alluding to earlier in the evening about a project this size and scale relative to what's been done maybe on other projects that have kind of a more straightforward path, you know, where you have a hearing on a project plus the EIR and you don't really necessarily have a lot of separate hearings on a draft EIR per se. Um, so this is a little unusual. So uh, when we're closer to having a draft EIR publication date, we'll be going back to the council with kind of a, a program, recommended program for uh, outreach and presentation of the material, um, including you know what the role of the planning commission would be. Uh, you know how you deal with some of these things that are you know very clear on the on a the public comment meetings are not really an opportunity for q and a but should there be opportunities for a more informal q and a between the preparers of the EIR and people who are interested possibly so it'd be kind of thing we could talk about a a meeting schedule that are some number of informational meetings that are in a way more informal the, the, the commission doesn't necessarily even have to host. They could be more of a true open house type setting where there are technical topics, two or three technical topics in, in a two-hour meeting or a three-hour meeting, and then people could interact with questions, informal questions, with the preparers of the EIR, for example. And maybe that would diffuse some of that, you know, this kind of question sort of aspect when it comes to the public uh, comment period but this would all be subject to council sort of review and approval as to what a what a program for a draft EIR review looks like so and I would think it's something like that then you could have inf materials about commenting mm -hmm. how to yes. how to kind of thing. So we'll be able to put those materials on the website you know pretty much immediately all with all the training modules that we've had and um, you know, we'll, we look at that as being something very additive and that'll be real world, real time available when, when the document's available that people can reference this training, the public training, etc. from the website. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And any questions? Uh, 
Um, I would like to make I would like to make a comment, and I want to thank the city for um, having this training for us. I think um, our trainers have been fabulous, <laughs> and um, we've really appreciated it. It's been very helpful, and it makes a daunting task um, seem more manageable somehow. I, I really appreciate all your help. Very well said. I uh, second okay. that. Anyone else oh, wants to make second any? Second that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mary. I just want to ask a quick question. Would it be appropriate for the planning commission at, at, uh, uh, during consideration of the final EIR to to say, you know, we don't think this is an adequate response to this thus and such comment, and we would like and we would like to see a better response to this. Yeah, I suppose. Hmm. I, I suppose. Yeah, the uh, the uh, planning commission certainly has the ability to to determine whether or not they feel the final ER is adequate. And if it appears to you, if you've gone, th if you spent the time to go through the, in that detail, uh, I suppose you could say that we think that perhaps a little more could be done to respond to that comment. That would be something that staff would be able to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Anyone else wants to make any comments? Uh, we'll, I'd like to hear from um, our dear city council member, <laughs> Mr. Miller, if you have anything else to add to this uh, or any suggestions or anything that can benefit us. Since you have been the planning commissioners many, many times, so. <laughs> I don't know whether I have anything uh, beneficial to say, but I want to um, second the uh, statement made that the plant the trainers have done an excellent job I think of of helping us get prepared and uh, we're we're pleased by that uh, and I know that you're going to do a, a good job but it's going to require a lot of homework mm -hmm. and uh, we're sorry for that but that's just the process <laughs> um, I did want to uh, maybe clarify, and this is kind of a question to staff and the trainers as well, about the different behavior of the Planning Commission at different stages in this process. Uh, because, you know, the first stage is mostly listening to people giving comments on the draft DIR, mm -hmm. but there's an interesting question which follows from Mary, could the Planning Commission make their own comments? on the draft DIR that they feel are in addition to what has already been presented by members of the public. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then how would that process work? Uh, and that's my first question. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question is, uh, at some point there will be then a final EIR product and then that raises the question of, you know, how much evaluative comment is appropriate for the Planning Commission to make in addition to public comments. Mm -hmm. And that's at a second stage. Well, you know, that's the final EIR. Mm -hmm. and then I presume that the Planning Commission will be making some kind of recommendation to the Council as, okay, we think that it's adequate or inadequate, <laughs> but I'm presuming that at some point you'll say, okay, it, we think it's adequate and uh, we would recommend to the City Council that they certify this as, as adequate. And then it needs to be made very clear, you, you really laid this out very well, that all we're saying is that we've got adequate information on the environmental impact to then go and start looking at the actual specifics of the project. Right. Right, yeah. and and you know a lot of people are going to have trouble understanding that because they'll want to talk about the project, right. uh, and that's why I'm thinking when you were you know suggesting you know what the chair of the commission could say or others that those kind of clarifications need to keep coming constantly. Yeah, and so I think there is a role for especially for the chair uh, to keep reminding people of okay this is what we're doing in this stage of the process. And that's going to be really hard to, to differentiate. And that needs to be constantly reiterated, I would think. Yeah. So that's going to be a big responsibility. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, because people love to talk about the project rather yeah. than the... I mean, right away they want to talk about, I agree or disagree with this particular aspect of the project. And that's not what the EIR process is right. about. Yeah, right? right? Right. Yeah. Anyway, those are my comments. And if you have any...
I have suggestions or comments you want to make to them. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, she has any uh, uh, care, have Karen one, has actually. I think it's for John. Oh, it's for John. Happy okay. for everybody in the room. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. If we, well, when we take the comments from the public, and then, as as Mary alluded to, we have other comments that we then want to make or. Karen, is your mic on? Excuse me. I sat close to it. Maybe you could hear me. So. The, the public makes their comments, and then as Mary alluded to, we may have some issues with the draft EIR at that point and have other comments of our own. What then would be that process for us? Well, um, I think when we go through figuring out the schedule mm -hmm. uh, with the council, uh, I think um, the councilman, Councilman Miller, made some, raised some very good points and questions and comments. Um, and Terry, I'll be glad, I'd be really interested in your, some of your feedback on this. Um, under CEQA, again, the Planning Commission doesn't really have any kind of formal role in a draft environmental review process and reviewing a draft EIR. There's no obligation that you have hearings, that you comment, that you, you take any action. Um, your formal role is on making a recommendation to the council as to the adequacy of the draft and well, the final EIR, which means the, the total of the record, the draft, the modifications, the comments and responses to comments. Um, so I think anytime as a body you take action on something less than the whole of the, of the record, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how the city attorney is going to feel about that. Uh, so because really your your role at the end of the day is is to be making a recommendation to the to the council on on those issues and you know would it be considered um, premature to certainly to to make comments about the draft EIR without having the whole record I'm not sure the city attorney would probably want to weigh in on that as individuals. You have your rights to, especially if you have just technical informational questions, you're like everybody else. You know, there, there are going to be means to get those questions out there. Um, but I'm, again, I have to, we have to sit down with the city attorney really as to whether as a body it's going to be appropriate for you to make uh, recommendations, formal recommendations, or take formal action on the draft EIR. Um, because then you really haven't seen the whole record, right. and I don't know. Again, what we're back to that issue that Terry raised about you know you're you're on the record and what you can say um, can be used against everybody. And if you predetermine, well, we think the draft EIR is X, and you don't have the full body of information, that I'm not sure how the city attorney would feel about right. that. Right. So I guess the protocol is as an individual mm -hmm. outside of the planning commission, if I have an issue or comment or whatever, how, how do we we'll formal, we'll, what do we do? We'll get you a formal, I'll, I'll get the commission a formal sort of um, opinion from the city attorney as to how to go, to go about doing this. So, so none of us are left kind of, yeah. in a way we're sort of thinking out loud, we're, you know, we're a number of, um, sometime before the actual publication of the document, so I'd rather kind of work out these sort of things in advance. But Ian Terry, if you have any sort of experience, I'd be uh, curious uh, what your experience is. Oh, could you come up? Have to decide. Let the city attorney come in and weigh in on what they think is is the best policy. Yeah, because various places do it differently. Some some do have their planning commissioners comment, and usually it's something in writing. You know, rather than a verbal comment, it would be a, a written comment. As a citizen, though, as an not, individual, not right, right, not mm -hmm. a commissioner, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions, uh, comments? Thank you very much, and we really appreciate what uh, you came all the way from Sacramento. Now drive very carefully, <laughs> right. especially that S curve. Don't go over 40 miles per hour. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thank you. That, that takes all the excitement out of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>